I'll have my. Can you hear me now? Oh, we got to turn on her mic. Yeah. Mm. Carolyn? Can you hear me? There's a lot of noise. It's a lot of noise. Can you hear me at all? Um, Carolyn, can you un unmute? Oh, I, I, I don't. Maybe I can unmute her. Okay. Uh, so short. And brief. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I might just say it in my own words. Yes. I won't go off. Yeah. Oh, I will. Um, but I wish I've there was a way. I have to like. Tonight. I don't know if I can it's unmute her. Awesome. I didn't hear. Her. I gotta do something so I can. Like, oh, I should I be able to. Oh, oh, I should be able to. A slanted thing. Yes. So and your then, eyes are like this instead of like this. And then after I give my speech. When people come to me and go, what the fuck? I'm going to say, more are improved. I don't know that you really have more changes. I have the one change. Yeah. I don't know if she can't see me. She can't see you. No, let me text her. You could send me a chat. Yeah. Oh. Send me a new version. We went. Oh, wait, hold on for a second. Let me. Can you hear us now? Back, but that's fine. It's how we go. Yeah, there's.
There's Jess. Sorry for the late start. We were waiting to check all of our public speakers in. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Santa Monica City Council meeting tonight, uh, the 27th of February, 2024. And could we all stand? And Council Member Parra will recite the Pledge of Allegiance for all of us. Please follow along. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And clerk, can you call roll call, please? Council Members Wick? Thank you. Present. Council Member Parr? Here. Council Member Davis? Here. Councilmember Tarosis? Here. Councilmember De La Torre? Here. Mayor Potem Negrete? Here. And Mayor Brock? Here. And I will now all council ask all council members if you will be recusing yourselves from any of the items on the agenda and pursuant to the Levine Act. Okay. We will now proceed with public input. Um, public comment is permitted only on items not on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. State law prohibits the city council from taking any action on items not listed on the agenda, including issues raised under this agenda item. And we have about 32 speakers. I'm going to call the first five names. And if you could please line up against the wall. Uh, Jason Gladstone. Janet Golery, Jill Hawkins, Nicole Washington, and Neil Comes Daniels. The first speaker could come up. Jason, Jason yeah. Hold on one minute, please. One there you go. There you go. Okay. Thank you. You can start over. Hi. My name is Jason Gladstone. I've been a petty cabber, petty cabist for 22 years, started in New York City in 2002 and been operating out here since 2015. I'm 50 years old and I'm an actor, and this is basically how I make my living between my acting jobs. I want to read you something really quickly, guys, which I think that, and ladies. Um, Santa Monica's second uh, shared mobility pilot program began uh, July 1st with five device uh, types provided by Velo, Vin, Spin, Wheels, and Lyft. In choosing three providers, members of the city's committee soared a variety of factors, including provider of experience, uh, rule compliance, device durability, sustainability, uh, safety features, affordability, local hiring, and computer and customer service. Between four providers, there are class one and class two e-bikes, two and three-wheeled uh, e-scooters, um, and two-seater, uh, two-seat wheel e-scooter uh, on an offer. Devices are not allowed on the sidewalk, Third Street Promenade, or pedicab bike path. With the exception of class one and class two e-bikes offered by Lyft and Velo, which are allowed to be ridden on the Santa Monica bike path. So my question is to everybody, 
If that's the case with these, why not the case for pedicabs? Um, if we're talking about danger, I've been out there all the time. I've not seen, I, to my knowledge, there's not been one police report made, an accident with a motorized pedicab. Uh, generally speaking, I go 12 to 13 miles per hour. Regular pedicab goes 10. Um, so I see these vehicles all the time. I see these golf carts, e-bikes, what have you, yet nobody kind of gives, gives a hoot about it. But with pedicabs, it has to be non-motor. Um, so that's basically what I'm talking about, maybe changing. Thank you, Mr. Gladstone. Next speaker is Janet Gullery. Hi, my name is Janet Gallery McKithen, and I'm the minister at the church in Ocean Park. And um, as you know, in 1958, uh, Silas um, White property was taken from the city of Santa Monica in order for them to supposedly create a parking lot. And now, decades later, there is no parking lot there, but there is a hotel there instead. He had to go from person to person to raise the money to buy what he was going to um, create was the Ebony Beach Club and he had members signed up they were ready to go and the Santa Monica City Council voted to take it from him by eminent domain a year over a year ago uh, this in these chambers the City Council read an amazing black apology it was incredible and it said you know we're so sorry for what we've done uh, we want to make it up to you we really 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 mean it uh, now here's your opportunity it's an opportunity to make things right. You have the opportunity to give the land back. His daughter Connie is uh, still alive and she would have access to that property or, or the results of that property, the wealth from that property, uh, had it not been taken. So generational wealth was taken as well as, I'm not sure what happened to those other folks who gave the money to Silas in order to buy the property. But you have an opportunity to make that apology more than words. Here is your chance to show that you're about action and not just talk. Here is your opportunity to be given an, an obvious way to make things right. The city of Santa Monica took the land and you have the power and the responsibility to give it back. At least it's the least you can do is to put it on the agenda and talk about it in public. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I have a video that they're going to play. And it's a four minute video, so I'll send you the rest later. But um, these are the people who are making decisions, taking away our rights and at the Capitol, taking away our freedoms. Give me a second. Give me a second. Oh, wait. I know what the uh, thing is. One day we'll move into the 21st century and be able to play a video like you can at home. We're not quite there yet. Will we be able to get this to work? I, I don't know. I don't know what the issue is. I can you just give, can you, 
speaking for two minutes? No, the, the video does. Yeah, I just didn't But if you it. can't get that going, can you give us a quick synopsis? No, I mean, I could play it on my phone, I guess, but it's, I'd rather have the video of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Okay. It's just I have a lot of speakers okay. and I need to get moving. Okay, I'm going to figure out the sound. You can't get it going, correct? I can't get it going. Okay, no, I'm sorry. I'll play it right now. <coughs> Uh, right here, hold on. It used to do science. Now it basically, uh, a lot of what it does is, is developing new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry, which it gives to them essentially for free in many cases. It's a terrible arrangement. NIH itself gets royalties. They, they can take about half of the royalties on some of the, like the Moderna vaccine. They own half of the royalties, so they'll get billions and billions of dollars. Not only that, but there's six individuals who work for NIH who were anti Fauci deputies who each get, got mar margin rights for the patents, so they own royalties. It's pretty astonishing because these are the regulators that are supposed to be looking for problems with these drugs before they give them to us and to protect us if this drug does well. They're going to pay for their boat. They're going to pay for their children's education. And as long as that drug is being sold to people, they can make a profit. So the last thing they want to do is find problems with it. So that explains the moral corruption in... They're not... Are they getting money from Big Pharma? The pharmaceutical industry is one of the biggest advertisers. Now, I think it was on $9.6 billion in advertising. The reporters themselves would deny that there's any kind of censorship or any kind of um, editorial, you know, prodding. And they, they will say science is what the CDC says it is. And I say to them, unless they're supposed to maintain a posture of fear or skepticism toward government officials, they're now doing the opposite. Uh, they have become propagandists for the government. Now, why is that happening? You can't just say they're being bought off by pharmaceutical companies. Yes. Part of that dynamic is a lot of influence by the intelligence agencies throughout the press. The largest funder today of journalism around the world, um, mainly funded through USAID, and they spend about... Thank you very much. Thank you. We apologize for not being able to play your video no tonight. The next speaker is Nicole Washington. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, I stand before you today on behalf of my cousin, Constance White, and her family. I am Nicole Washington, and I'm an educator. Please wake up and do what is right. An apology letter is simply not enough to heal the wounds inflicted by families and descendants affected by eminent domain. I am a descendant of this community. Keep in mind, not much has changed. I personally was subjected to biases in 2017. Shame on Belmar Apartments. Ironically, it sits behind Belmar Triangle and neighbors to Silas White's land and known as the Viceroy Hotel. I'm saddened. The scars run deep in this community, but erasing generations of history, heritage, and wealth is simply unjustifiable. It is time for the City Council to acknowledge the harm that was done and take concrete steps towards reparations. We cannot simply brush, brush aside the injustices of the past and pretend that a mere apology will suffice. It is incumbent upon this council to find ways to make a change and certainly equitable. The only thing that my family owns in Santa Monica are plots and graves at Woodlawn Cemetery. Please let us work together to ensure that the legacy of eminent domain in Santa Monica is one of justice, fairness, and compassion for all residents, whether it's past, present, or future. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Neil Comes Daniels. And Mr. Daniels, before you get uh, started, I'm going to call a few more names. Mary Jo Dalton, Nate Rue, Matthew Hom, and Kevon Ward. 
You may begin. Good evening. I'm Rabbi Neil Comus Daniels. I'm the Emeritus Rabbi of Beth Shear Shalom at 19th and California. I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees of Clue Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. I'm here speaking about our hotel crisis and uh, the workers who are trying to get uh, a just and fair situation at the hotels. There's a moral and ethical side to all of this. Certainly there is in my tradition um, when we are explicitly mandated to not oppress our laborers. Commentaries from centuries of rabbis detail how we are to respect the full humanity of people who work for us. As one commentary says, our responsibilities are limitless. This particular passage also notes that even the wages that are provided to people who are on the lower end of the economic scale are not sufficient to provide for their economic security. And later, the law insists that these people must be paid at the end of the day, noting that they often put their lives at risk in order to earn their wages. We also have a situation with possible hiring of foreigners who came in thanks to the governor of Texas, um, and these people were hired in ways that um, they didn't know how much money they were making, they didn't know their hours, they didn't know their rights. We are also told not to put a stumbling block before the blind, and that's exactly what happened at these hotels. We had a truth commission that we held in November, and uh, several people are gonna follow me to talk about what we discovered at that Truth Commission, what we're trying to do find, uh, going forward, and the 500 people who have signed on to that Truth Commission letter, which I have a copy for you, uh, for, for each of you. We must take our significant share of responsibility for what's going on in Santa Monica, these hotels. We've been asking you to do this for years. I Thank you, sir. You can give it to the clerk, and the clerk will get it to us. The next speaker is Thank Mary you, Rabbi. Sorry. The next speaker is Mary Jo Dalton. We're going to swap. Uh, and you are Nate Rue. Rue. Okay. Hi, my name is the Reverend Nate Rue. I am the rector at uh, St. Augustine by the Sea uh, Episcopal Church in, here in Santa Monica. Uh, I've been there since the uh, 1880s. And, and, um, and, um, and I'm also a member of Clue. And on November 16th, uh, trusted Santa Monica faith leaders, community members, and local elected leaders gathered at my congregation to hear worker and migrant testimonies about violence against workers and the exploitation of unhoused migrant workers in Santa Monica hotels. I was honored to join them. Workers' testimonies revolved primarily around violence they experienced on the picket line, company retaliation against workers in leadership roles with the union, and exploitative migrant labor at Strzok Hotels. Also, in a scandal that is currently being investigated by the offices of Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon and California Labor Commissioner Lilia Garcia Brower, La Meridian Delfina also brought in unhoused migrants to replace striking workers at their property. One such subcontracted refugee worker shared in his testimony that due to staff shortages, he did the work of three or four people without being told of his right to 10 minute breaks. In early January, we delivered a copy of our final Truth Commission report and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is uh, Mary Jo Dalton. Thank you. I'm Mary Jo Dalton. I am a resident of Santa Monica for 48 years and a member of St. Monica's Catholic Community and a member of CLU. So since that time, nearly 500 community members have signed on to this report, calling the city of Santa Monica to take these recommendations seriously. Over decades, Santa Monica has <clears throat> led the nation to pass legislation to protect workers for moments like this, like these, when wealthy hospitality com <coughs> companies take advantage of the most vulnerable workers. We urge the city of Santa Monica to do the following. First, we call on the city to demand an end to retaliation against striking workers. Retaliation has not ended on the, pick and la on the picket line. The workers' struggle is now nearly in its eighth month, and workers are still facing reprisals for exercising their legally protected right to strike. Listen to the workers and the findings of the Truth Commission. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dalton. The next speaker is Matthew Hong. Uh, good evening, Mayor Davis and honorable members of the City Council. My name is Matthew Hom, and I'm the faith-rooted organizer in Los Angeles and Santa Monica at CLU, Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice. So continuing on the recommendations from the Truth Commission letter that Rabbi Neal um, has delivered to you um, again, um, second recommendation is that we call on the city to prioritize its investigation as to whether the migrants brought in as replacement workers during strikes at La Meridian Dolfina Hotel have received the applicable minimum wages per the city's local ordinance, whether they have been provided personal security devices and proper training on the use of such devices as the city law requires, in addition to training on other rights intended to protect workers from threatening conduct as required by the Hotel Worker Protection Ordinance. In a little bit, um, our other clue leaders, uh, Kathy Gentili and Louis Watanabe and Reverend Jim Kahn, We'll share more aspects of the findings of the Truth Commission, as well as why we're urgently asking you to protect the rights of workers of all industries um, to be able to organize, picket strike, and to live and work in the city. And then we'll also hear from two of the workers themselves to share their testimonies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hom. The next speaker is Kevin uh, Ward. And before you get started, I'm just going to call a few more names. Kathy Gentili, Louis Wantonby, Jim Kahn. And Autumn Brian, you may begin. Hi, my name is Kavon Ward, and I'm the founder of Justice for Bruce's Beach and Where Is My Land. With the exception of Council Members Zwick and, T and Tarosis, I stand before you disappointed in this council, as you are not honoring commitments made in your black apology. I'm especially disappointed in you, Mayor Brock, who approached me 10 minutes before the last city council meeting and told me how much you love black people because you played basketball with them and went to school with, and I quote, the blacks. You also said that you wanted to meet with me and the family to discuss remedy, but that meeting never happened. So since I didn't have the opportunity to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to take this opportunity to address you now. And I ask that you remove your Trump-like, you know, ego in an effort to truly hear and understand me. Imagine what your life would be like if your mother's land was stolen here in Santa Monica and she was not able to pass down generational wealth and land to you. Imagine what your life would be like if you couldn't live rent free in one of your marvelous properties that your mother owns and that's going to be passed down to you. Imagine what your life would be like if you didn't have the privilege of worrying about rent hikes and having to uproot your life and God forbid becoming unhoused. You of all people should be in support of returning that stolen land back to the white family and compensating them for over 60 years of lost wealth. Instead, you make excuses like the city of Santa Monica can't afford to pay reparations, we'll go bankrupt. But what baffles me the most is the fact that you can afford to pay an approved payment for $700,000 to Jared Powell. You can afford to pay out $228 million in settlement for sexual abuse claims. And you can afford for the Viceroy to pay you little to nothing to rent the land they stand on, even though they make millions of dollars a year off of the land stolen from Silas White. We can't afford it is no longer an excuse. What you can't afford is another lawsuit, because taking land by eminent domain means that it should be taken for public use, and the Viceroy, Ho Viceroy Hotel is not a public entity. Thank you. The next speaker, the next speaker is Kathy Gentili. Good evening, Your Honor, Brock, and fellow council members. My name is Kathy Gentili. I've lived in Santa Monica since 1985. I have been before many city councils, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Community Church here in Santa Monica, as well as a longtime member of Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice. Um, so I was supposed to say the examples brought forth by the workers, but they haven't spoken yet, so I'm just going to say there is a problem with labor enforcement in the hospitality industry. How workers or enforcement agencies can regulate the many shadowy staffing agencies that pay the checks of employees, a problem that persists even at wealthy large corporations with professional human resources departments. To this end, we urge 
the city to gather information about each staffing industry, utilize, excuse me, agency utilized by the hotels named in the letter that had been delivered to you earlier this evening, and to collect basic information about each company, the firms with which they work, and the employees employed by each firm. Thank you. The next speaker. Is Thank you, Ms. Gentilly. The next speaker is Louis Louis Montenby. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Louis Watanabe, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, St. Monica Catholic community. Uh, I'm also a member of CLU, and uh, my family has had uh, a century of association with the City of Santa Monica, including my uh, uncle, uh, Kay Watanabe, who retired as a city treasurer. So, um, so I, I just wanted to... Um, talk a little bit about the hotel workers and their contributions to Santa Monica's economy. And, and that's really quite enormous. I mean, it's a very important part, I think, of, of, of who we are as a city. And, um, and so they provide that, uh, that sacred act of hospitality to folks visiting our city from around the world. And uh, we pr pride ourselves in the city on our progressive policies and values. And um, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, what we do is we protect the entire community, visitors, workers, and uh, neighbors. And um, Santa Monica has fought for workers' rights and safety, um, and these rights must now be upheld. Um, and we call upon the city to take seriously the recommendations of the Truth Commission and to act now in ways that are outlined uh, to protect workers by enforcing the policies of uh, Santa Monicans have fought hard to win. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Watanabe. Jim Kahn. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, I'm Reverend Jim Kahn. I'm with Clue. And um, I was there the day of the um, events that occurred at the Miramar. Um, I, had, in fact, had been invited to speak to try to provide some sort of spiritual encouragement to the people who were striking that day and who were on the picket line. Um, a as the uh, people went back from the rally to the picket line, I was distracted by uh, the invitation to speak to a camera. And um, so I, I did that. And then uh, by the time that I returned to where I thought the picket line ought to be, I discovered that the picket line had gone inside the walls of that space there on the parking lot, which they have every legal right to do. Um, but the um, people who were um, supposed to be uh, protecting the property for the Miramar, um, they didn't like it. And there were a few people who were there, and I uh, sadly watched as they were backed up and then knocked down to the ground. And, uh, and then um, the police cars began to show up, and I think there were a half a dozen of them. I didn't know there were a half a dozen squad cars on duty at one time in Santa Monica, um, but uh, they were all there. And um, it was only because of the intervention of one of the leaders of the HRE that uh, the police, I don't know what they were going to do, uh, but um, clearly, they, they thought that um, the strikers were not supposed to be where they were. And uh, it took a strict lecture, actually, from the leadership of HERE to, for them to understand that there were legal boundaries here and the workers had not uh, left over those boundaries. This Thank you, Reverend. The next speaker is Brittany, I'm sorry, Autumn Brion. And before you get started, Ms. Brion, I'm going to call a few more names. Uh, Patricia, I'm sorry, Patricia Ibanez, Liliana Hernandez, Brittany, Zachary, and Chandra. You may proceed. Thank you. Hello, my name is Autumn Brion. I'm an artist and I'm a fourth generation Angelino. The city of Santa Monica needs to return Silas White's land immediately. Silas White and his descendants were not only robbed of substantial economic growth, 
but we were also robbed of the chance to experience Ebony Beach Club, which White, in his own words, imagined would be one of the best establishments in America for the lodging and comfort of my people. Silas White's Ebony Beach Club would have been a haven for black folks to be safe, to rest, to dream, and to escape the same racism that destroyed Ebony Beach Club when the city of Santa Monica seized Silas White's land. If Ebony Beach Club wasn't destroyed, what thinkers and artists would have birthed creative, world-changing ideas while enjoying the beach together? If Ebony Beach Club wasn't destroyed, how different would the quality of life be for black residents? We cannot travel back in time to change the past, but the city of Santa Monica can do something right now to change the future. Returning Silas White's land is a small step in rectifying the harm done to the White family, and it also sets a significant precedent for land reparations. I would love to witness this city choose to be on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Patricia Ibanez. Buenas tardes, líderes de Santa Mónica. Mi nombre es Patricia Ibáñez y soy una recamarera en el Hotel Le Meridian Delfina por 17 años es, y he sido un líder junto con mis compañeros durante esta lucha por un contrato justo. Me suspendieron el año pasado en octubre 13, un día después de liderar una delegación y por teléfono. Todo fue durante un día de mi descanso. Me mandaron un guarni por mi correo electrónico durante ese día, después de la llamada. Yo tengo renta y pagos que hacer y no sé a hoy cómo puedo hacer las cosas, ¿verdad? Tengo una hija que es universitaria y que depende totalmente de mí. Entonces, esta represaria es algo incorrecto y me ha afectado bastante. Les pido, por favor, a todos los líderes de la ciudad que exijan a estas corporaciones un fin a las represarias en contra de nosotros, el pilar de la industria hospitalaria tan próspera de esta ciudad. Les pido, por favor, que escuchen mi voz, ya que yo soy la voz ahorita, en este momento, de muchos de mis compañeros que hemos sido muy afectados. Por favor, gracias. Good evening, leaders of Santa Monica. My name is Patricia Ibanez, and I am a housekeeper at the Le Meridian Delfina Hotel. I've been there for 17 years, and I have been a leader with my coworkers as we fight for a fair contract. I was suspended last year on October 13th, a day after leading a delegation with my coworkers. I was suspended by phone during my day off. The hotel then sent me the warning via email after that call. I have rent, I have other payments that cannot be paid later. I have a college-aged daughter who still depends on me. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it all. The retaliation I have faced is not okay. We ask you, the city leaders, to step up and demand these corporations stop retaliating against us. We are the backbone of this city's booming tourism and hospitality industry. I am the voice tonight of all of my coworkers who are not here. I am the voice. Please listen to me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Patricia. Or Ilana? Ilana Hernandez. Ilana. Ilana. Uh, good evening, city council members. My name is Liliana Hernandez. I'm a housekeeper at the Fairmont Miramar Hotel. My co-workers and I won a tentative agreement, but we have to go through a lot, including violence that you hear in, in meetings before to get there. The city of Santa Monica has the opportunity to step in now and help make sure that it doesn't get worse for workers like our cameras at the Bicerot and the Meridian Delfina. Enforce your laws and use your voice to ensure that all workers in Santa Monica are treated with the same dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you, Ileana. Brittany. Hi, my name is Brittany Frazier. Mainstream feminism has always devalued black women, which was evidenced during the last city council meeting. 
Four council women sat on the days when Kayvon Ward was silenced. Did any of these women course correct and speak out on her behalf? Black women face a painful and isolating reality. Female representation often means nothing because allyship is foreign in the face of white supremacy. Silas White's land needs to be returned to his family immediately. The city council continues to drag its feet on material repair, and it is because black women are championing this cause. The black apology that was issued nearly two years ago, what tangibles have resulted from it? Santa Monica admitted to systematically targeting communities of color for condemnation. What will city council do to rectify these deliberate harms? What are they waiting for? Thank you, Brittany. Zachary? Good evening, council. Um, I'm here again in support of allowing motorized pedicabs on the bike path. I will just reiterate that I think that non-motorized pedicabs are significant like risk to the people on the bike path. And um, yeah, I have some associates here with me that are also in favor of, of changing that municipal code. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. Thank you, Zach. The next speaker is Chandra. And Ms. Chandra, before you get started, I'm gonna call a few more names. Chase Sherman, Michael Milana, Joanne Berlin, and Denise Barton. You may proceed. Hello, my name is Chandra, and I would like to provide you the Ebony Beach Club timeline. Nineteen forty four to nineteen fifty seven, the former Santa Monica Elk Lodge sits abandoned for thirteen years. May nineteen fifty seven, Silas White, age fifty two, Santa Monica resident since nineteen twenty five, and a owner of a laundromat, two real estate offices, a hamburger stand, purchased the vacant eighteen eleven Ocean Avenue property. 1958, the city of Santa Monica uses eminent domain claiming the property is necessary for city parking lot. 1958 to 1959, Silas White battles in court to retain his property supported by the previous owner, Bennett Dorsey, who sold him the property. January 1960, the city of Santa Monica delimishes Silas White's property and shatters his dreams of the Ebony Beach Club. During the same year, he becomes ill, but due to his emotional state, neglects receiving proper, proper treatment. 1962, Silas White dies at the age of 57. 1966, the city of Mon Santa Monica enters a ground lease agreement with Royal Inn of America Incorporated to develop a first class hotel. September 2000, the, the property becomes the first class Viceroy Hotel with the city of Santa Monica receiving funds from the Viceroy for the lease of the very same property until 2065. As of 2024, the Viceroy Hotel has completed a $21 million renovation. Thank you, Chandra. Sherman. Hello, Council. I would like to also represent the pedicab motorized community and uh, point out that just as if a car drives too slowly on a highway. Sir, you can lift the mic up. You don't have to bend over like that. Just as if a car drives too slowly on a highway, it puts the other cars at risk and should get a ticket. Uh, Non-motorized cabs on the bike path are putting bikers and motorized bikes that are allowed on the bike path at risk. And they're in an awkward speed where they don't really fit on the bike path and they also don't really fit obviously on the walking path that's next to it. And if a non-motorized bike, or sorry, a, a motorized cab 
was allowed on the bike path, it could keep up with the speed of all the other um, vehicles that are moving at that speed. And so that's it. Thank you very much, Chase. The next speaker is uh, Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Camordo. I'm a family friend of Milana Davis, niece of Connie White. Connie White has sent in a video at 8.45 in the morning. She is Silas White's daughter, and I would like that to be played right now. Thank you. Hopefully we can get it to work this My name is Connie White. I'm the daughter of Silas White, and I'd like to share with you some of the experiences that we shared during my childhood. They used to take me to Santa Monica Beach, the only part that we were allowed to go to at that time. And he would hold me high on his shoulders so I could see the water, and also because I was afraid of the sand crabs. After a short while being there, my dad would announce, well, it's time to go home. And I would start crying, and i say, I don't want to go home yet. I want to stay. And he said, we're soaking wet. We can't stay because there's no place to change clothes unless we use a public restroom or change in our car. So we went home, and every week it was the same thing, week after week. Over the years, my dad started talking about businesses and community. And I really believe that the seed for the eventual Ebony Beach Club really was planted from those experiences at the beach with him. His first endeavor in business was to open a laundromat for his community between 17th and 18th Street uh, on Pico. Then he opened two real estate offices and later he opened a hamburger stand. All three businesses were very successful. However, he continued to talk about community, and he kept saying, I want to do more, I want to do something. Eventually, the idea of a beach club really formulated well, and he decided it was time to do something about it. In the meantime, he hired an architect to draw plans for his dream home, uh, which was located and still stands on 20th Street in Santa Monica. The amount of lying done to me by the medical and pharmaceutical establishments oh, in the way. It's working now. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Please give Silas White's descendants back their land. Thank you, Michael. The next speaker is Milana. Good evening. In her video, Connie wanted to share with you the accomplishments of her father, his spirit, his intelligence, his creativity, his desire to give to his community, and his tenacious ability to follow through and get it done. I have no doubt that had his dream not been demolished and shattered like the windows of his property in his efforts to provide the Ebony Beach Club to this community, he would have done so, and it would have been spectacular. I would like to share with you some of his daughter's accomplishments, despite what was done to her father and her family. Connie White not only became an accomplished musician, but she also graduated from UCLA, received advanced degrees, and went on to pursue a career in education, where she served as a teacher, counselor, bilingual teacher, principal, and adjunct university professor. Last meeting, I suggested that those truly interested in gaining a better understanding of these issues should see Ava DuVernay's origin. This time, I urge you to listen to Tremaine Lee's Uncounted Millions podcast. That being said, watching and listening to gain further understanding is a wonderful thing, but I would like to end with a quote that was recently shared with me. Be careful of allies 
who are more interested in learning about black pain than giving up the status and wealth that flow from the wound. True solidarity costs something. Cole Arthur Riley, Black Liturgies. Thank you. Thank you, Melania. Land Berlin. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Joanne Berlin. Um, two of us from the steering committee for the Committee for Racial Justice were tabling last Saturday at the Greens Festival. And um, we, we do that usually to make people aware of us and our monthly workshops and so forth. But we also were bringing up this issue of uh, the Silas White's experience. And just the, just the talking with people, a number of them had heard something about it, but didn't know very much about it. And um, even though it's been on local news lately and even national news lately, but um, they um, were, were interested. And I would just start out with some, the history, like you just heard, that after 13 years of sitting empty, this uh, old building was bought and the land was bought by Silas White in 57. And then I went on to say, and in 58, the, um, to, to build a, a Ebony Beach Club. And then in 58, the city took it from him by eminent domain. And, uh, you know, and, and then I, I, I can go on and say a few more things, but already I can see they're like, what? I mean, say what? You know, it, it was just, uh, so we were asking them to sign the petition. I had this little QR code and they could click on that. And if anybody wants to click on it tonight, you can sign the petition. Um, they just were, horrified at this kind of uh, history just fairly recently in the 1950s. Um, and it's, it's something that people just don't understand. The personal racism, this man experienced threats. Um, this man, as you heard, died shortly after his struggle to... Thank you, Joanne. And Ms. Barton, before you get started, I'm going to call a few more names. Daria, April Banks, John Medlam, Lawrence Cohen, and Jerry Rubin. Uh, you may begin. Good evening. Tonight I'd like to make some points about the Human Service Grant Services Program from the February 20th, 2024 Audit Subcommittee meeting, item 3C. Let's start with organizations from your financial year 2023 to 27 human services grant program funding recommendations, which could not locate su support for samples taken by Moss Adams for audit for 2020-2021, such as Family Services of Santa Monica, including five of the ten timesheet samples, and in another case could not locate two of the ten samples of payment. The Clare Foundation was then able to provide any documentation support for expenditures. The Hospitality Trading Academy did not have documented approval of the expenditures prior to the payment payment disbursement for four of 15 samples selected. St. Joseph Center had a few sections where documentation or support was not provided in 20 of 42 samples. Then I also wonder if you're getting your money's worth through the development agreement with Providence St. John's Health Center, where two samples selected included a FAST employee, yet PSJ said that their timesheet had been purged. I find this interesting, considering aren't you supposed to hold records for seven years for tax purposes? Finally, the people concerned, which between Clo the Cloverfield Services, the Interim Housing and Wellness Program, Sojourn Service Program, and the Access Service Program, there was $1.4 million that couldn't be reconciled between the budget ledger and expenditures. Aren't these federal grant funds, and what is the city's liability? And all of this is the result of human services city staff not doing their job and following up on grant funding. Showing again the city and city council are not good stewards of the public funds. Just something to keep in mind for the budget item this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hey, uh, Daria? Hi, good evening. My name is Daria Jones, and I'm a member of the Church in Ocean Park. I would like to express my support for council members Caroline Terosius and Jesse Zwick 
in giving back the land that was stolen from Mr. White by eminent domain in 1958. I'd also like to encourage and invite other council members in discussing this matter of land injustice officially on the agenda. I believe this is an opportunity to act in accordance with the apology issued by the Santa Monica Black Apology. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Next is uh, April Banks. Good evening, my name is April Banks. I am an artist and I have been working with students at Santa Monica High and Crossroads to unfortunately tell them about this erased history um, here in Santa Monica. The workshops at Santa Monica High were um, a world building exercise that imagined the Ebony Beach Club in the year 2070. I feel that sometimes the only way to even have hope around these issues is to imagine an alternate future. This is an opportunity for an alternate future. Um, in the process, I have become friends with Connie White. I love her father's dream. I was trained as an architect. In order, seeing the drawings, um, I could understand what his intentions were. They are great illustrations for talking to students who were completely shocked by this history, especially Belmar being across from Santa Monica High. And so, I urge you to do the right thing. I know there's been a black apology, but um, an apology is not enough. Connie White is still alive. Her, her descendants are still alive. There's the opportunity to do what's right and return the land. Thank you. Thank you, April. John Medlam. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and city council members and staff. I first lived here in May of 1967, and I've been here now for 27 consecutive years. And as you've heard me say more than once, what's the number one priority of all governments? Public safety. We recently had a report on the uh, crimes in the city of Santa Monica. Let's give you some updates on this. Violent crimes per 100,000. Santa Monica, 758, up 0.7%. Beverly Hills, 493, down 0.2%. California, 709, down 3.1%. Now, what about the public safety as a percentage of budget? That's fire, public and, and uh, fire and police. Santa Monica spent in the current 2023-24 fiscal year, 187 million out of 745 million, 25% of its budget goes to public safety. Out of the, for the 91,300 people, that's $2,048 per person, per person. Beverly Hills spent $161 million out of $626 million, 26% of their, for their 31,900 people, that's $5,862 per person. So obviously they're paying almost three times what we're paying, and obviously their crime rate is significantly less. Something I found quite interesting, tonight we've heard people we want to get reparations for a gentleman who was robbed of his land a long time ago. We had the pedicab people been coming here constantly to get motorized pedicabs. And then we had the workers who want to get a fair shake. Something we always have to leave, live with, though, is as of June 30, 2023, the general fund total non-restricted reserves amounted to approximately 50% of what they were in June of 2019. Since 2020, demands on reserves have been impacted by a service loss of revenue as a result of the pandemic. Thank you, John. Next speaker is Lawrence Cohen. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about the online sexual exploitation of minors. It's a problem that's running rampant. You may have seen recently that uh, all of the um, uh, heads of the major online um, uh, companies like Meta uh, were there at Congress and they were being called down on the carpet for not doing more to protect children. So I'm here to say that there's a very important event coming up in Santa Monica at the Monica Lemley Theater on Mar March 20th. It's a free event and we'll be showing a 45-minute documentary about the problem and then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, about the solutions. On the panel is going to be a young woman that at age 15, she was recruited uh, online 
into uh, years of sexual exploitation and prostitution. And she's now 27, and uh, the ramifications of that experience are, are profound. So if you would like to come to the Lemley on March 20th, 7 o'clock, there are free tickets available. Vulnerable Innocence, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-C-E, Lemley, dot eventbrite, dot com. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> Next speaker is Jerry Rubin. And before you get started, Mr. Rubin, I'm going to call the last few names. Jonathan Foster, Harvey Etter, Zoe Montaner, Michael Pitkin, Eliza Jane Franklin. You may proceed, Mr. Rubin. Uh, thank you, Jerry Rubin, Santa Monica. Honorable Mayor Brock. Mayor Pro Tem Negretti, Honorable Council Members, City Manager, City Attorney, City Staff, City Clerk, Honorable Police Officers, and Fellow Santa Monicans. A couple of quick items. One is, I'd like to wish uh, renowned architect and Santa Monica resident Frank Geary a happy birthday tomorrow, his 95th. His project is pending, and I think it'll be good for the city. Good Union Hotel, good community benefits and a viewing tower that will benefit the school district. So I hope we can move that along. Second item is to acknowledge something I hope that can be brought back. Our Honorable Council Member and Mayor Glean Davis talked about the need to support our animal shelters. I'm wearing this t-shirt. We got our, our beautiful kitty cat Sunny from an animal shelter. This was gifted to me by my friend Marilyn. And I think it's a worthwhile thing if that could be resumed. And I would hope, Mayor, that uh, any procedure can be worked out to do it, and maybe even a couple more things. I think it would be a worthwhile to spend a few minutes at every council member meeting to do that. It would only take a few minutes. So thank you, uh, Gleam Dave Davis, and I'm sure the animals are grateful to you and all the people that love their pets from the animal shelter in Santa Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Hello, Jonathan Foster. Uh, I guess we'll try to start with this. Oh, shoot. It was... Uh, the topic is the two sides of black uh, issues that I've dealt with in the last week. You know, this is something that happened. This. Sorry. I don't know if it's Kavon or Kavon Ward. Come on. Before and so she, um, the last meeting, the mic was off for this black female. She never got her time back. And I think to avoid the issue, you should um, have realized, all the city council, this whole place should have realized what was taking place and the gravity of the situation and gave her her two minutes again. So it was for the record. An apology needs to be given formally, I think, on the docket. Uh, for that, I thought that was, I mean, that was just a, a blatant bunch of bullshit that nobody gave her her two minutes back. Now, on the other side of this, one minute, I was on Third Street Promenade at the drum set where I have kids around and these four black guys are there with their pot going off, uh, blowing on me like it was a joke. And I say, hey, guys, can you get rid of the pot? Can you move the smoke? What are you talking? Hey, uh, guys, can you, uh, I'm right here. Can you move? Uh, what, are you, what are you doing? Why don't you come take it from them? I was like, now you turn it into an assault like I'm going to come over and take the pot away. I'm just asking you, can you move the pot away from me, the smoke? Oh, we don't got to do that. Um, sir, they passed a law out here. There's all kinds of different people out here with your smoke. I was just asking, can you take it? And now you've turned it into a fight. And I'm born the day Jimi Hendrix was died. I've been playing drums since I was two in 1973. I, I've got two jazz degrees, and I've been around so many black people on stage. I mean, I was just asking, could they move the smoke down there? That's all I was just trying to ask. But I do love them very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Harvey Etter. Council, uh, my name is Harvey Etter. I'm talking for myself, for the Public Solar Power Coalition, and for homeless folks and low-income tenants 
in this community and around. Um, I want to tell my personal kind of problem, and I want to incorporate by reference this book by Joseph Stiglitz, uh, The Price of Inequality. And that's basically, there's a chapter about losing democracy. He has a Nobel in economics. He's at Columbia. He ran the uh, World Bank. Okay. Um, yesterday I was robbed. I come into my place. Everything's gone. Okay. Including evidence and litigation that I've been involved with for over 30, 35 years on air pollution with the South Coast District, with the State Air Board, and the Environmental Protection Agency. All right. This was what was mailed to me after it w there three times this happened before that. This is the fourth time within two years is over at Step Up. I'm being evicted. I got a notice to quit about a month ago. It said I owed about a grand. Um, anyway, there, there, there's big. I went to the Housing Commission. I told them about that. Re more recently, I got one that said I owed twenty six hundred. Okay, there's no provisions. I didn't have a co copy of my contract. I went to the clerks. I went to the Housing Commission a couple of weeks ago. I talked about this. I said I'm coming down. I want my records. I don't know what my damn rent is. I met this Dorothy. She didn't realize that I, I go back with her a long time, and she's like hit person for, for these guys for the Housing Authority. Um, it's outrageous that you can't get your own records, that you're treated like crap by, by, by staff over at the clerk's office. I put stuff in there a week ago, I, I, trying to get all this stuff, and I, I told you some of the summaries. I'm running out of time. I'll make some comments related to this indirectly. Uh, indirect. Thank you, Harvey. I'm sorry for your loss. Next speaker, Zoe Montaner. Sorry. Uh, let me know when my time starts. Hi. Um, good evening. I, I wish I could plan a better speech for tonight. I'm going to be pausing because um, I'm going through a lot. My mother passed away on January 20th. I had to leave to Puerto Rico to plan her funeral and burial and then take care of the issues of the her estate. In the meantime, I've been harassed by my former landlord and her attorney. They don't want to return my property. I made a collection of evidence for you to review. The Santa Monica Cassidy Attorney's Office published a piece on the Santa Monica Daily Press focused on housing rights and resources continues at City Attorney's Office on November 22 of 2021. Shortly after that, my landlord started a campaign of three-day notices and harassment, and the notices are here. I filed my first of five complaints with the city attorney on February 9 over here. Former city uh, deputy city attorney um, um, Gary Rhodes wrote emails to Marty Kaplan several times because she continued her practice. Now the attorney that is also a Santa Monica son of a big landlord um, property owner says that I had to pay them over $3,000 for my property because they put it on storage. Uh, the court told them that I needed to be provided with a um, itemization and inventory of my property. They don't want to do it. On the 29th of, of November, they told me to go to my apartment to pick up my property. My landlord showed up. She assaulted me. All this is on video. All this is was witnessed by a Santa Monica resident, longtime resident, and business owner. So I have a witnesses. And the Santa Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. You make yourself. Next speaker is Michael Pitkin. Michael Joseph Pitkin. I am First Nations 3E people of this earth. 
European, Eastern European. I do have a right to be critical of other sovereign and First Nations peoples in discussions of war, peace, and civil rights, harms, and abuse. Rumor is my grandfather on my mother's side either killed the Russian royal family as an operative, or I am the real Russian royal family, as my aunts Anna and Mary did not survive the Russian Revolution. Communists and President Vladimir Putin do not like my speech. Then again, he is grandson of Vladimir Lenin. I, however, believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and the press, and the right to protest my own government. My grandfather was trained as a tailor in St. Petersburg. He was part of a team of tradesmen sent to establish lumber towns of Burns, Hines, Oregon. I guess he and all my family have dual identities similar to the movie Greenland, which now daily I am being gang stalked, harassed, hacked, abused, violated for being white privileged. On my father's side, I trace my family tree 1,500 years all through Europe's and America's histories. There is a Pitkin in George Washington's cabinet. There is Pitkin, Mississippi, Pitkin County, Colorado, including Bell and Aspen, Pitkin Avenue in New York. My brother kept Long Beach from sinkholes at Thumbs, a conglomerate of Texaco, Humble, Union, Mobile, and Shell. I am a descendant of Marie Antoinette. Is this a tale of two cities? My grandmother is a Kaiser. Again, BIPOC community gossip is, I am a paperclip Nazi, legally fruit of the poisonous tree. Thank you, Michael. Next is Eliza Jane Franklin Leggett. And before you get started, Ms. Leggett, I'm gonna call the last two names, Regina Ramirez and Robbie Jones. You may proceed. Greetings, my name is Eliza Jane Franklin Leggett, and I'm currently a graduate student in USC's Heritage Conservation Program and a graduate of UCLA's Urban Planning Program. I made a clear decision to go into a field where 1% of the professional field is represented by African Americans because of the acknowledge, unacknowledgement and erasure of our histories and marginalized peoples. As a lynching victim descendant and a mother of five children, I am well aware of the impact of legacy and stolen legacies. In the context of the white family, the theft of the land not only impacted the generational wealth of the family, but can easily be blamed for the death of Silas White, as so often our ancestors, as so often our ancestors due to de jure segregation and racism, die with their dreams in their bellies. Um, and in this situation, Mr. White was unable to maintain his land ownership and his dream of the Ebony Beach Club. For so many black families, we have lived through the lens of a dollar and a dream where we have taken limited economic resources to maximize on our belief system that we are deserving of what is a reality for white folks and their descendants. The conversation we are having today cannot be had without acknowledging space, place, and race. As formerly enslaved people who as a race have been other since we were brought to this country, land takes on a different connotation in context to African Americans. Land ownership has a clear meaning for black folks from coast to coast. It is a definitive symbol of freedom. The silence of the city council on this matter makes you all complicit. You are complicit in the death of Silas White. You are complicit in the theft of the land. You are complicit in the robbery of the generational wealth for the White family. In the words of Zora Neale Hurston, if you're silent about their your pain, they'll kill you and they'll say you in Thank you, Eliza. Media, no longer will black people be silent about the land theft and the repatriation of Bruce's Beach has given you a clear example of what to do. Give the land back. Thank Here. you, Eliza. Next is Regina Ramirez. Nice to meet you, Council. This is the first time I'm here at a meeting. I do want to address that I am a homeless individual residing within a shelter. The name is Upward Bound House, here located in the city of Santa Monica. 1020 12th Street is our address. I'm here to address the concerns and many raise um, questions as to why everything that's going on in our building and by the management, including the CEO, which her name is Christine Glasco, and the associate director, Brenda Thomas, why they failed to do their jobs and how is it that no one, no one has been able to replace them and have someone who is deserving 
and compassionate and has knowledge in how to assist the homeless community, especially like mothers like myself with children. I am also a cervical cancer diagnostic who is in remission and having to go to LASA, countless LASA meetings, having to conduct myself with these professionals, knowing that all they have to do is simply do their job to assist the homeless community so that we no longer remain homeless or not re-entered back or are not with our children out on tents or living out of our cars is extremely disappointing. I come here to advise you all that I will, I will, you will see me again, and I will continue to raise awareness on what's going on at Upward Bound House until the city gets involved, because at this point, the city says that they have no jurisdiction over what happens at Upward Bound House, and I am constantly redirected to housing authorities within the city. St. Joseph Center is the only family, family solution center, and they are not willing to help us. I, I, I don't know what else to do, and I don't know where else to turn. I am not familiar with your positions here on the council, but mind you, I will do my my own investigating to educate myself on each individual in each individual here. Regina, um, if you can go step over to the back of the room there, the assistant city manager would like to talk to you and find out more about the problems you're having. Thank you so much. I want to start with a quote. Even as you make progress, you need the discipline to keep from backtracking and sabotaging the success as it's happening. Nipsey Hussle. You heard the timeline of what happened with the Silas White property on, with, mis with Mr. White. I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. I was one year old when this man, this black man, a community member of mine, had his dream and his property stolen from he and his family. A calculated crime, actually, because, you know, we all know that eminent domain on black people is just by choice, calculated. I just want to say this, that something maybe people know and don't know. We know the dream for Mr. Silas White that you've heard from his daughter talk about what he envisioned. And I agree with the young woman that said not only his dream was taken, but our community dream was taken as well. I had the honor uh, during COVID to, to, well, right after COVID, to tour uh, an investor, a group of young black men, including um, partners of Nipsey Hussle, and they told me the story that they were interested in purchasing the Viceroy to make a nightclub and entertainment center. Now, I realize this is generations away, but it's no coincidence. He didn't even know the history of what happened with that property. And when I told him on the Black History Tour of Santa Monica that I gave him, he was blown away and went back and told his partners as well. Of course, they did not go through, weren't able to go through with it, but it was a spiritual situation, if you get what I'm saying. It was no coincidence. Give the property back. Thank you, Robbie. Sorry for the interruption. And that concludes public input um, on item one. Item two, public input for agenda items under closed session, special agenda items, consent calendar only. No public input is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. And we have about 20 speakers on this item. First, we have a caller by phone, Natalia Zernitska. And then in, per in person, Ian Dutton, Carl Villane, Michael Brodsky, and Rowan Sullivan. If you could please line up. This is on consent. Ms. Zernitska, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, your time starts now. Okay, um, good evening. My name is Natalia Zernitska, and I'm testifying tonight on items 3B and 4B. 
First, on item 3B, I wanted to express my gratitude in advance for the update from the city manager on Santa Monica's bike action plan and Vision Zero efforts. I appreciate the renewed focus on making our city streets safer for all of us. Although there's no formal action for the city council to take tonight on the city manager's report, I urge the council to please reflect on the information that's going to be provided and to work collaboratively to implement best practices to improve safety on our streets. I believe that's something that we can all agree on in this city with many very strong and diverse opinions is that we all want to see the number of fatalities and significant injuries from traffic violence drop to zero. And I believe that this is an achievable goal if we prioritize safety on our streets rather than convenience and speed for those who need to or choose to use motor vehicles. I look forward to hearing the update. And regarding item 4B, I'm once again urging the council to stay the course on this litigation. The Court of Appeals remanded the case back to the Superior Court for a new trial. And the city's legal filings show that the city supported remand while the plaintiff's attorney did not. The Superior Court will have the opportunity to examine the totality of the facts and circumstances around Santa Monica's elections and determine whether the city's electoral system is in violation of the California Voting Rights Act. The California Supreme Court clarified in their opinion that both racially polarized voting and vote dilution must be proven to demonstrate a violation of the law. And they, they defined how vote dilution would be proven under the law. Given the totality of the facts and circumstances of Santa Monica elections, including that Latino preferred candidates win their races more often than not, and that Latino voters would be made worse off by the plaintiff's proposed remedy of by district elections, it is likely that the plaintiffs will not be able to prove racially polarized voting or vote dilution, so they would not be able to prove a violation of the CVRA. Then the course is also the most fiscally responsible choice, as any additional cost would only marginally increase the current city's current anticipated expenditures on the case. There may also be a possibility of the city recovering some of its legal costs if the initial court of appeal ruling <coughs> excuse me, if the initial court of appeal ruling where the judges unanimously awarded costs to the city is any indication. Further, I urge Councilmember De La Torre to recuse himself from item four B and future items regarding the CBRA lawsuit as he has a clear conflict of interest on the item. Prior to being elected to the council, the council member served as the chair of the one of the plaintiffs and served as its representative during the initial trial, and the other plaintiff is his spouse. It is clear that participating in closed session discussions related to this case is an undeniable conflict of interest. To summarize, if Santa Monica voters wish to explore the possibility of changing our electoral system, there will be plenty of time to do so after this case is resolved. As we're a charter city, our form of government is for the citizens alone to decide with their voices at the ballot box. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to watching the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Natalia. The next speaker is Ian uh, Really quick, uh, Mayor, uh, I'd like to, yes, I, personal point of privilege. Uh, the, last, the last speaker mentioned that uh, I have a conflict of interest in engaging in any discussion around the California Voting Rights Act uh, litigation, and I just want to remind everyone that uh, this city council voted to exclude me from those conversations, and there was a lawsuit that I had to file, and after 800000 plus that the city spent against uh, myself and my attorney, uh, a judge uh, reviewed all the facts and said that I have no conflict. So, you know, I'm really, uh, it's really offensive to hear non-lawyers, you know, make comments consistently that I have a conflict when this was litigated, it was vetted by a, a third party, a judge that determined that I have no conflict. And I just, in closing, just want to say that I would have wished that uh, uh, the last speaker would have, would have also mentioned that uh, we have spent millions of dollars. I mean, Ms. Ward, she made a really good point that that uh that we have money to pay for a lot of things and this government has spent millions of dollars fighting against latino voting rights and yet it makes it very difficult to say that we don't have the funding to compensate people you know for reparations and for uh imminent domain taking of land so i just want to make that clear thank you thank you council mandela Torre. can we go to the next public comment please Yes, Mr. Dutton, could you please state for the record which items you're speaking on? Uh, yes, uh, with respect to, uh, to uh, 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 agenda item 3B, the, uh, the 
bicycle master plan. Um, I'll be especially brief, actually. I just wanted to thank the city for its commitments to making streets safer for pedestrians, uh, correct, sorry, for pedestrian cyclists and transit users in establishing Santa Monica as a leader in safe streets in LA County. Uh, it's the reason that my wife and I chose Santa Monica to move to, and it makes it possible for me to commute to my job at LAX by bike, and for my wife and I to leave our car behind for almost all of our uh, needs getting around in Santa Monica. Um, I urge the council to endorse, expedite, and expand the Bicycle Master Plan and pay particular attention to closing gaps and making connections with prote protected bike lanes within the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next is Carl Villain. Good evening, council. My name is Carol Villain, and I'm here to speak in support of item 3B. I know, shocker. Um, I'm sure many, most, maybe all of you will thank staff for their presentation tonight and let everyone know that you support safe streets. And that's great, but the thing is, you can't just say that tonight and then not support these projects when it, once it's time to implement them. And I'm not saying this because I personally benefit from them directly, though I do. As someone who started riding a bike out of necessity, I already enjoy all the benefits of riding a bike. And I really enjoy street improvements that make me feel like my life matters. And the thing is, Fear of cars is the number one reason why many people choose not to get around without a car. It's quite ironic, but I get it. Like many other people, I fear for my life regularly when I'm walking or biking. This is why I think the one of the most exciting things about these projects is that they help people who currently mostly get around by car, get, uh, they give the pe people who currently get around by car more options and different ways to get around. That doesn't mean you will no longer have the option to get around by car if you need or want to. It just means that there will be more safe, accessible, enjoyable options available to you, your kids, your parents, and your neighbors. It is clear that multimodal streets are not just better for, for all. They're a necessity in cities. This is why I urge you not only to support these projects, but also to strive for more. We all use these streets every day in one way or another. And it's up to us whether we make them a dangerous, polluting, miserable space or a safe, accessible, sustainable, and enjoyable one regardless of how you choose or need to get around. So let's do the right thing. And thanks to the Mobility Division for all the awesome work they do because these people work their butt off every day to make the city better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Michael Brodsky. Hello, <clears throat> I'm speaking on 3B. My name is Michael Brodsky. I'm on the board of the Santa Monica Spoke Bicycle and pedestrian advocacy group right here in Santa Monica. And it's kind of deja vu because in 2011, uh, I held my helmet and along with other community members, we spoke in favor of the new bicycle action plan. And congratulations, that plan has been extraordinary. Special thanks to the council and the staff that's implemented that plan. But we need to move on and we need to move forward and we need to provide safety for our community. So as well as this program has been, over the last decade we've had numerous deaths and injuries on our city streets. And we need to make our seats safer for people from the age 8 to 80 and I'm closing in on 80. And hopefully it will not take another uh, 13 years uh, to move forward with this plan. And we need to provide safe routes to schools, to um, parks to work and to shop and this bicycle action plan is the step that it's going to take us there and hopefully in three years and not 13 years so thank you very much for supporting this plan thank you michael rowan sullivan and before you get started i'm going to call a few more names emily hasung christian adera lawrence von klan paula sizek and juan matute you may proceed Hello, good evening everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about freebie on the protected bike lanes. I've been in Santa Monica for five years now and I've started a family here with my wife and two kids now. I use the bike lanes to get to the, the school runs, to drop them off at school at Sam Ohio ITC. I use the commute to work and for errands and love what you've built so far. And I'm truly excited to see what you're going to build in the next year or two. Um, just wanted to say that creating a network of protected bike lanes is a win-win for everyone. It provides an attractive alternative method of travel for all ages. 
by improving conditions for cyclists. And improving conditions for cyclists uh, alleviates congestion and stress for drivers that choose to stay on the road too. So I think it should be great for all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rowan. Emily Hassong. Hi, folks. Good evening. My name is Emily Shung. Um, I'm a resident of Santa Monica, and I live uh, in Sunset Park on 16th and Ocean Park. Um, I moved to Santa Monica specifically because of the be better bike infrastructure that would enable me to use my car maybe a few times a week, maybe zero times a week. I want to, to obviously express my support for 3B here because it's clear <coughs> from our pedestrian and cyclist deaths that our infrastructure could still be better than it is now. I believe that better infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists will create safer streets, a higher quality of life, better physical and mental health for our residents, and fight climate change and the worsening traffic in all of LA County. So please support 3B. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Christian Adara. Good evening, my name is Krishna Dara, and I'm here to speak on item 3B. Um, I'm a current student at Santa Monica College and a member of the SAMO Safe Street Alliance Youth Leadership Collective. Um, as a student at SMC, biking is my preferred method of commuting, and it's my way of connecting with our community and expressing my commitment to sustainability. Um, still, I'm keenly aware of the safety issues, especially um, in underserved neighborhoods that discourage many from considering biking as a practical option. Um, growing up in the Pico District neighborhood, I often find myself resorting um, to biking on sidewalks or navigating through residential areas and obstacles just to find a safe path, which increases, sometimes even doubles, my travel time. Um, this discrepancy isn't just inconvenient, it's fundamentally unfair. Everyone should have equal access to safe biking routes, regardless of where they live in the city. And the proposed bike action plan amendments in Vision Zero presents a crucial opportunity to address these concerns, making our streets safer and more accessible for everyone. By prioritizing the development of our protected bike lanes, you encourage a safer, healthier, more sustainable, and more equitable Santa Monica. The benefits of the bike action plan are just too good to sidetrack um, or not take immediate action on. Imagine the impact, children biking to school without fear, elderly residents exploring their community easily and confidently, um, and, commuter and commuters choosing bikes, scooters, and skateboards over cars, um, for, for shorter trips and knowing that they'll arrive safely at their destination. Supporting these plans means investing in the well-being of our community, both now and for generations to come. While progress has been made, thank you to our mobility team, um, there's still much work ahead and I strongly urge you to continue pushing towards a future where every journey is safe, available, accessible, enjoyable um, for all residents. And thank you for your time, your vision, and your commitment to making Santa Monica a city we can all be proud of. Thank you, Christian. Lorraine Von Kwan. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Lorraine Von Klan. I'm co-chair of Climate Action Santa Monica and executive director. Uh, thank you for the city's great work on the mobility network so far. I'm here to urge you to adopt the plan amendments for the bicycle plan and to really set your sights as leaders of the city on building out a complete mobility network and accelerating it. We all know that uh, time is of the essence with respect to climate and our greenhouse gas emissions here in the city of Santa Monica are primarily from transportation. As a mother, uh, who's watched her son uh, with his first job at pavilions, biking at odd hours to get where he needed to get to, uh, riding his bike to school. I was terribly, terribly scared. The bike racks at Samo High are full. So at Lincoln Middle School, they are full. We love our Vikings. We love our kids and our public schools. We have to fully build out the mobility network to keep them safe. I know it's tough. We have growing pains until we fully build it out. Think of the great things we have here that we need to stitch together. The mini circuit buses, the ride share for seniors. There's a whole mobility network awaiting for us, waiting for us. And you as city leaders can bring your vision to make this a world-class showcase 
for mobility where our economics, our tourism, people come here to say, yes, that beachfront city, Santa Monica, is so cool. You can get anywhere riding the little electric bus, taking a bicycle, hailing a ride. Think of the future. It's coming. Uh, and these are just growing pains. We have to respect our automobiles. Thank you, Lorraine. We can do it. Thank you. Next is Paula Sizek. Good evening, I'm Paula Sizek. I walked here tonight and I was really happy to see that the bike racks downstairs were actually full coming in. A lot of people are using bikes. Look, this is really quite simple. The safer people feel riding bikes, the more people bike. The more infrastructure that you have, the safer people feel, the more people ride bikes, and the more other people on the streets get used to there being more bikes. They, in turn, become more used to looking out for bikes and pedestrians, making it overall safety increased, right? This is actually a virtual cycle that we can start here today. So I uh, just wanted to voice my support for 3B and continued mobility in Santa Monica. Thank you, Paula. Next is Juan Matute. And Mr. Matute, before you get started, I'm going to call some more names. So Dupti uh, Rashikanda, Varun Bhak, I'm sorry, Bhatnagar, Connor Webb, Erica Leslie, and Nancy Coleman. You may proceed. Good evening, Mayor Bronk, Honorable Council Members. My name is Juan Matute. I'm a 16-year resident of Santa Monica. I was originally drawn to Santa Monica because I was living in Westwood, and the bi biking and the beach was better here. So I moved to Santa Monica, and I've decided to stay. Um, <clears throat> so advancing the bike action plan, the pedestrian action plan, is one about one of the fundamental about one of the fundamental powers and reasons for. Uh, local government to exist, which is to promote health, safety, and general welfare. Uh, having safe streets for people 8 to 80, uh, you know, as father of a kid who just turned 8, I think it should be younger than 8 to 80, but they say 8 to 80. Um, that's about having freedom in the place that you live, to walk around. My kid doesn't drive, obviously. He scoots around. None of you want to be at a memorial to a kid that got hit because they were scooting by an alley. And you see that. I see that sometimes, too, where a car just comes out of an alley suddenly. And so there are all these opportunities to make little improvements that mitigate that risk. Um, and I think it's really important to not lose the forest for the trees. So we're talking about a big plan, implementation of all of these different measures, you know, maps, you know, investment plans. But each individual measure might have some controversy to it, but if you just focus on that controversy, you lose the force and the general safety and welfare benefits of having streets that are safe uh, for all our children and seniors. And um, so I really think it's important to think, uh, my, my kid asks me, now that the 17th Street bike lanes are installed, if we're going out on a bike ride, he's always asking me, are we gonna go on 17th Street? And I say, yes, we can go on 17th Street. And he loves it. And then I tell him, well, Broadway will look like that too. And maybe 26 too, and Stewart too. And he's so excited about it because when he goes to Lincoln Middle School. Thank you, Juan. Sudipi Rashikanda. Hello, um, I am also um, speaking to you in support of 3B and urging you to adopt the plan amendments and prioritize building a mobility network. So I recently moved here in October for my husband's job and previously we lived in Chicago and New York City and when we learned we were moving here, I was very nervous about moving to a place that was car dependent after not having a car in my adult life. But after doing research about LA and learning more about the areas, we specifically chose Santa Monica because we heard you don't need to have a car here. Um, it's been wonderful biking around here. We've really, really enjoyed it. But it's not enough to just have the bike lanes that we have. Every time we bike here, it does feel like you're risking your life. Drivers here, especially compared to where we lived before, do not pay attention to cyclists. It's been a noticeable difference. But biking on streets like 17th Street is a breath of fresh air. And it makes me excited to continue biking and living here for the long term. Having a car is not an option for everyone, and studies show that creating safer streets with protected bike lanes not only benefits cyclists, but everyone, including the elderly and children. We should try to make sure our streets are equitable and safe and good for everyone in this town. So urge you all to support this plan. Thank you. Thank you. 
Karun Bhatnagar. Hello, Varun Bhatnagar speaking also in support of 3B. Um, as Sadeepthi stated, we recently moved here. And uh, uh, to add a little bit more color to that decision, we were debating actually between moving between moving to Boston, moving to sh staying in Chicago, or moving to Santa Monica. The big decision actually came down to the mobility aspect. Would I be able to uh, need? Would we need a car every day of the week? And the reason that we chose Santa Monica was for that reason. We don't need to have a car for every day. Um, we still, though, whenever we bike or whenever we walk, we still fear for our lives because there are so many cars. The, few, the more cars that we take off the street with this bike master plan, the better. I also want to emphasize the climate implications for this plan. Uh, obviously, we're living in a climate emergency. And this is uh, really crucial to reduce the fo uh, carbon footprint of Santa Monica. Uh, I also want to emphasize that we will align ourselves with Los Angeles's HLA plan, uh, which is a great initiative, but we can't let LA take the lead here. We need Santa Monica to still be setting the tone of what biking infrastructure looks like in Southern California. Um, Los Angeles's weather and extensive streets is a blessing, and we should not let that go to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Hunter Webb. And Mr. Webb, you have a video. You want me to start it now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. This one? Yeah, that's it. So the last time I was here in December, I came to speak to you with my bright yellow jacket. Um, I was That first video was uh, from on my way here to speak in support of the Bike Action Plan Amendment. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to provide some visual evidence to back up some statistics that we know. And we know that about 60% of people in U.S. cities consider themselves interested but concerned uh, to cycle. About 80% of those people would feel comfortable cycling with protected lanes. For a local example, UCLA commissioned a study in 2019 uh, to connect their Westwood and Santa Monica hospitals with active mobility. They found that 48% of respondents cited uh, a lack of protective uh, infrastructure as a main reason they felt discouraged to cycle. Uh, it was second only to uh, uh, dangerous driving behavior and speeding. Um, you know, so I just wanted to back that up with this video to show that you know, this is real. This is a real safety issue in our community. We've done a lot, but paint is not infrastructure. And so I urge everyone here to uh, support and expedite and expand the bike action plan, uh, you know, and show that you prioritize safe streets for all road users in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. Erica Leslie. Here we go again with this little mic. <laughs> When are we going to get a bigger mic? Some for people that are a little bit higher than 5'2". <laughs> I am here to speak about the CVRA lawsuit, item 4B. Our city is only 8.3 miles, square feet, square miles, I'm sorry, in comparison to Los Angeles, which is 469 square miles. We're a little city. And all of our residents aren't in one spot in this city. The one thing that COVID did do is spread our residents everywhere. All of our minorities are not just in one spot any longer. The only color that mattered during COVID due to the desperate times and desperate measure was green. That's all they cared about. If you had some money, you could move anywhere around this city. So therefore, a racially charged lawsuit that is about the disenfranchisement of our people as a black woman 
who won my seat does not make sense for the city of Santa Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Nancy Coleman, and before you get started, Ms. Coleman, I'm going to call a few more names. More. So, let me understand something. I thought that we were only speaking on the bike action plan because that was item 3B and that we were then going to, to four to the four items and the five items after that. Is that correct? So this is three items. It's public input on closed session, okay. uh, special agenda items, and consent okay. calendar. So if you're speaking on... Okay, let me take on, on all three of my items then. I want one minute on the, um, on the bike action plan. Um, before you adopt the bike action plan, I want you to ask the question, have you tried driving where there is a stop sign and a bike never stops? A bike goes through every single stop sign on 14th Street from San Vicente to Wilshire without ever stopping. If I will support bike, the bike plan, I want the bikers to respect the stop signs, the stop lights, and not go five abreast, but only in the bike lanes. I ask that for for the sake of all residents. The second point, on Ocean Avenue, where all of the bike lines have now been uh, posted, um, while they're not all protected, they've put up barriers such that you cannot make a right-hand turn if you're coming north onto California until all the bikers and pedestrians have gone by, which means that the traffic behind, because it's only one lane with one Thank you, Nancy. Let me now turn to your time. The others or not. What are your other items? Are they under closed session? And yes. There, one is consent and one is closed session. And you want a minute for each of those as well? Two, two minutes for the for each? lawsuit and two minutes for the, uh, for the other item. Did she have to clerk? Did she have to sign up in advance for? I did time? that. She did. I did. You did. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Um. I am very concerned about, sorry, that was. Oh, let's wait till we get your microphone back on. No. Okay. Later on in the agenda, you're going to be dealing with budget adjustments. One of the largest items that we have spent in the city over the last 10 years has been for the lawsuit brought on district voting. I would hope that now that it's back at the district court again, the court that originally established um, uh, district voting, that you would go along with that and not continue to try and fight this incredibly difficult suit and go instead accept it, stop the draining of city coffers for outside, for Gibson Dutcher, Kutcher, and also think about it's time to look at and determine what the district should be and to have public meetings around determining what the district should be. My last term item. Item 5E. This is the salary increase for Doug Sloan, our city attorney. I am very much opposed to adding additional funds to his salary. But I am also concerned that additional terms and conditions should be added to his um, uh, employment agreement. You're already modifying his employment agreement. The first item is that he respond to residents. The second item is that the response is given in a timely fashion. And the third, that he meet with the neighborhood organizations. In the time period that he has been here, he has never responded to an email. I used to be the chair of the North of Montana Neighborhood Association and had reached out shortly after he got here to see if he would come and talk to us. He never responded to it. He never answered the email. And he has never responded to any email and or any uh, request by neighborhood associations. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to call the last few names on the list. Um, Debbie Mulvaney, Nicole Ferries. Uh, give me a second. 
Um, sorry, people are signing up, so the list jumps. Um, Jonathan Foster, Harvey Etter, Regina Ramirez, and Erica Leslie, I have you signed up again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. okay. You may proceed. Okay. I'm speaking on 4B. My name is Debbie Mulvaney. I am speaking on behalf of all of your constituents who don't want you to give up on doing what is right for the city. I am here again tonight because the city is on the verge of winning the CVRA, CVRA case and you should stay the course. The only issue resolved thus far is the constitutional one. The Court of Appeals ruled that Santa Monica's at-large elections for city council are constitutional, rejecting the plaintiff's argument and reversing the original trial court's decision. That decision is now final. Through three appellate rounds, plaintiffs have argued without success that the appellate court should defer to the original trial court decision. That argument has been met with rejection or silence at each stage. Now the case will return to a new trial with a new judge. To prevail in this case, plaintiffs must prove racially polarized voting and vote dilution. I believe that the plaintiffs will fail on both these issues as actual election results in Santa Monica do not support either of those conclusions. When this case is over and the city wins, there will, will be ample time to discuss if an alternative election system will better serve our community and the voters will have the ultimate decision. I believe citizens would rather have seven votes every four years rather than one. There is absolutely no reason to spend any money now settling with the plaintiffs when the city has come so far and you are about to win. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Nicole Ferries. Good evening. Um, Mayor Brock, uh, Vice Mayor Negretti, and City Council members. Um, I'm here this evening again to urge you to stay the course regarding the CVRA lawsuit. Um, this is the best course of action for the city and its residents. The courts um, made it clear that the plaintiffs have to prove violation of the CVRA, both racially uh, polarized voting and voter dilution. The election data for Santa Monica election shows that our community has voted for and elected officials on both city council and school board over the years that reflect diversity in our community. While I strongly support the CVRA, for many cities, it's not applicable uh, in Santa Monica. Um, potential settlement of this case would not be a financially responsible decision, um, as the financial liabilities still remain, and that would have um, a negative impact on the city coffers at a time when the city budget's already constrained. Um, we're switching to at-large uh, elections, uh, switching from at-large elections to districts, uh, would conflict with the Santa Monica City Charter. I believe that Santa Monica voters will continue to elect people who represent our community. However, if the election, if the way elections are run in Santa Monica need to be changed, that discussion should happen in an open fashion and put on the ballot for a vote by the people to allow their voices to be heard. It looks like the city could win the case, so please allow the court an opportunity to make a definitive ruling in the Santa Monica CVRA case. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Jonathan Foster. Mr. Foster, I have you down for two items. Are you speaking on two items or just? I'm hoping on a 3B and a, a 5F and 5G kind of combined. Okay, so you, you can, you have four minutes left, so you have four minutes for those three items. Okay, that probably won't need it. I just want to start off with God bless the mayor and the, the vice mayor. I hope you two are doing all right from here. hope you can straighten stuff out. hope you going to become Republicans. It's a different topic. Maybe we can get you changed on some of that stuff. So I want to talk about the bike lane. Has anybody ever thought about putting that bike lane next to the sidewalk and getting the bikes off the road? There's a sidewalk. It goes all, uh, and why can't they just have the bike lane next and, and so it's not on the road where it's so effing dangerous you could get killed? I want Santa Monica maybe consider that concept. Get a bike lane, it, it, redo the sidewalk, got a tree line, redo the and have a, a real bike lane. It's just a thought. I've never heard anybody talk about that kind of stuff. I remember it was, it was Stephen King, he got hit on his bicycle, or was he running? Something like that. It was, it's been some awful, awful things. So I want to talk about 
F and 5G and salary and stuff. I've talked about this a few times, how the wage disparity goes. And see, I'm, I'm a person who's, after I was young and then I kind of grew up, and I'm still kind of stupid on a few things, but I've learned a few other things too. And that is <clears throat> everybody is getting grossly underpaid unless you're the investor and on the on the board and you know need a big investor and you need to get your money when you invested in a certain place and that's that money that goes to those people and into the profit margin is is the very money that was supposed to be paid to the labor that's how Amazon Bezos is getting rich and now he's doing robots he didn't pay people what they were supposed to get paid and he just put the money in his bank account He's a jerk. Because I, I personally would like to advise him that you should love other humans and take all that billions and actually pay the worker something that they can, they can do. See, And there's another problem with everything that's going on is we can't hear the discussion. You two go into, dis all y'all go into discussion on, I on, on agenda items and we don't get to hear the inner info or the inner agendas. We can't speak to what's been said. You become unaccountable. We can't speak to what you talked about. That's not, that's not good government, personally. The city attorney is a good guy, okay? It, let's, but see, what I've been getting to is I want to pay humans. I don't want to pay job function. I want to pay a human being. So the city manager is no different from somebody that's doing a cash register or doing road work. He is no different from anybody that's working at Starbucks or is moving trash. And if we're doing big paychecks, we need to do big on other things. But we can't do this to the mom and pop pizza shop. We have to do this to Amazon or Big Oil. People like that. that that's a, They're doing this to Pizza Hut and they're laying off people. McDonald's is having a hard time with $18 Big Macs, and really the problem is that, that Amazon should have been paid. Uh, what's the guy, uh, Mark Zuckerberg with uh, Meta and, and Facebook, they should be made to pay, not robots who pay uh, people, not job function. So I hope maybe I'm influential in this concept. This is what I've been saying is this. wages are not adjusted to inflation. The city council of Los Angeles makes... One hundred dollars an hour. Why? I mean, that's just a lot of money to be a city council member. So, anyways, God bless. Uh, God bless the mayor. God bless the city council and you guys. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, Harvey Etter. Uh. I I'm. Am I supposed to on on the 11 for the joint meeting of the housing commission? Um, so I, the is that going to come later? So that's just later. that's later. So, so I just have two minutes now. I guess for five. Uh, five. I think it's e. Five e. Five f. Okay. You have two minutes for both of those items, or. Uh. So that still gives me time to talk on the 11? No. When, yes? So you can get six minutes per night. So you already have two. So you have four minutes left for this evening. So you can speak on one minute uh, on one item and two minutes on the other, and two minutes later you, you can speak. So I have to save some for 11? Yes. Okay. So let me let me save two for 11, and let's do, do two on 5 E and F. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Harvey Etter. I'm talking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition. Um, in reference to these, number 5E is California Department of Housing and Community Development, this incentive grant program. Uh, and down here it says that they want exemptions from CEQA. Well, for, I don't think there's, a, there's a, a big issue here. The issue that I brought up before of equity, equality. Okay, we're talking a lot of money, a lot of contracts. We're talking uh, almost 9,000 units going to be built in here in, 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 in the details on one of these things that they just gave me late. And, and that 70% uh, is supposed to be for low, low, low income and all this. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot of units. 
How are these going to be distributed? I know there's a, a environmental law and equity. There's Institute of Berkeley and this and that in different places around the state. But we've got to decide. I mean, is it people from the community, supporting the community, working in the community? How long they've been here? What do they do? Are there functions? How poor are they? And, and I just heard the Housing Commission took the lowest off. Uh, and, and how in the hell did they do it? It, it, it? It contradicts what was just handed out by, by clerk, okay? Um, so two and a half million units, a million's got to be, got to be lo low income. And uh, of that million, they, you had it divided by three in, in an article in the Times. And, and they took away, they said, the lowest. And they said on the other end, I don't know how the hell they did it, that's a, qu a third of a million units. They said there's going to be 30,000 on the upper end. The, the penthouses from a million to five million. They can put 20, 30, 40 buildings. They got applications right now. That ain't going to happen. If it's not going to happen, we got to stop it right now, right here in River City. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Something's rotten in Denmark, as Willie said. Thank you, Harvey. Next is Regina Ramirez. I initially was only going to speak in the public, but then I got the agenda and read through it and seen that um, 5F and 5E speaks of housing and um, the homeless community. And as you guys heard, I am part of the homeless community. Um, I am also interested on in knowing, like the way Mr. Harvey said, who is that going to go for? Because I was not part of this district. And I was moved from a different, I was moved from the second district within Los Angeles County into the third district, which is Santa Monica. So like he said, do I or am I a constituent that should be allowed to have that housing opportunity? Neither one of my children um, attend school here yet. They're not eligible, right? So um, I think it's very important when you guys are looking into these low income um, new developments and these um, these new funds that are going into these developments. And I do believe that um, firsthand, the homeless person that's sitting on the sidewalk should have um, the same the same um, option for, for them to be permanently housed. But to make sure that happens, there's a bunch of resources. Um, you guys will be hearing from me more. Um, but within the resources that are supposed to be rendered to the homeless community, we are not getting those resources. And the cities within within their corresponding areas and districts and 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 jurisdictions should be no should be notified or be made aware by the way the email did not go through so um so i do um want to just piggyback on what he was speaking in regards to that um I do believe that the housing authority here in Santa Monica needs to have some type of contract with interim housing or bridge housing that is located here in the city of Santa Monica. That would allow communication um, and and people can be held accountable more easily because here at Upward Valley, they failed to communicate that to the housing authority. Thank you, Regina. And Erica Leslie. Good evening again. Um, simply put, as I was looking at the agenda myself as well, and I see that, wait, hold on, I'm 5E, about budget changes. There should not be any raises for anybody we need to rehire some of the 400 that were laid off pre-COVID. We need more people in our housing services to relieve some of our overburdened and overwhelmed staff. There's no way, as our residents are coming and asking for clean and safe streets, there's no way for us to do that unless we get some of these people off the streets. We have to do better, not lift up somebody else's wages while we have all these people still sitting out here unhoused. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And that concludes public input for item two. Item 3A, Proclamation Freeze Week, Los Angeles. 
So if Sophia Klotzer could come up to the podium. And I'm going to read a proclamation, and then I'll come down and hand it to you. Great. Um, I think you've done this before. <laughs> uh, whereas the city of Santa Monica is excited to welcome Freeze back to the Santa Monica Airport, which has a rich history as the former home of the Douglas Aircraft Company and the birthplace of the DC-3, and is now home to over 60 artist studios and a number of creative venues, and whereas the eyes of the international art world are upon us, experiencing all that our great city has to offer, and whereas the fair brings together over 95 leading galleries from across 21 countries, with nearly 50% of them operating in the greater Los Angeles area, and it is, is expected to attract 35,000 guests starting tomorrow. No, Thursday, February 29th to March 3rd, 2024. And whereas the city of Santa Monica is grateful that two sculptures by acclaimed American artists featured in the fair's public program will be displayed beyond the fair through April 7th at SMO. And whereas for the second year, we will add to Santa Monica's Municipal Art Bank collection with an acquisition by an emerging Santa Mon uh, Southern California artist selected from the Ferris Focus section and generously supported by Freeze Los Angeles and the Santa Monica Arts Collection. Now, therefore, I, Phil Brock, Mayor of the City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of our City Council, do hereby take great pleasure in proclaiming February 29th to March 3rd as Freeze Week 2024 in the city of Santa Monica. Yay. That's great. All right. And now accepted on behalf of Freeze in the city. All right, thank there you, you so much. And can I, can I thank people or should we just say, do this? You should thank okay. people. Thank you. And explain maybe a drop about Freeze. I would love to, yes. And then maybe we can take and a photo. And then I too. understand our staff photographer is going to take a picture of it. Fabulous. Um, so we're very grateful for the support of the city council leadership and city leadership for fostering this partnership with Freeze. Uh, Christine Messio, director of the America's Four Freeze, wishes that she could be here in person tonight and does look forward to the pre fair launch with all of you later this week. I also do want to thank all the hard work from city staff at the airport, public works, landscape, transportation, community development, and cultural affairs. It has taken many departments working together to make this happen. With Freeze, we're connecting to local artists and arts organizations and leveraging opportunities to expand the arts at both the Santa Monica Airport and across the city. This includes Open House at Bergamot Station on Saturday, now featuring the work of Judy Baca, who is newly at Bergamot in B1, uh, LA Art Space Arts and Music Festival on 3rd Street Promenade on Saturday, and open studios at 18th Street across from the fair on Sunday. Plus, the pier is hosting the first LA Food and Wine Festival all weekend. So I do hope that I will see you at Freeze, where we can meet artists and look at that together. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if you can come over here, all I right. guess. There you go. And? Are you the official? You must be the official. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> they want us to go back and city council, if you could gather around, I guess. We want to see Oscar's mustache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Do you want to flip? I'll flip. Okay, here we go. I want to make sure you get seen. That's all right. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll zoom up to be close. One, two, three, two, three. <laughs> all right. Never mind. Like I gave up on him a long time ago. <laughs> the good news is they're yeah. usually blurry anyway. Yeah. I like when it's on newspaper paper. Right. Me too. Thanks for that. I'll just jump right in to be uh, brief before I invite uh, the team up. So uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Um, first off, I just want to uh, acknowledge and extend deep uh, gratitude to our Virginia Avenue Park staff for organizing a wonderful event uh, this past weekend. 
Uh, we celebrated the Greens Festival at Virginia Avenue Park, and it was absolutely uh, wonderful. <clears throat> also, uh, I do want to make everyone aware of a few upcoming events just uh, for community announcements. So obviously this Thursday, we will have our State of the City Address. I'm looking forward to uh, what seemingly will be a robust gathering of the community. So looking forward to sharing all of our wonderful accomplishments. And then uh, March 2nd, this coming Saturday, our DEI team will host a Community Solutions Summit as the next phase in the process to create our own citywide equity plan. It will be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Blink Spaces on 1450 Second Street with a virtual option as well. Um, and you can find more information on our website to RSVP. And that's important because I think space only for about 75 people. And second, uh, fitting we have our mobility team here and our director of transportation as part of the city's brighter blue service planning initiative. Big Blue Bus is working on a roadmap for system enhancements over the next five years. The goal is to expand access to fast, frequent, and reliable transportation in Santa Monica and West LA. I do encourage everyone to attend one of the workshops BBB is hosting next week. I think it's March 6th and 7th are the two dates. And take the online survey to share your input. And more information about that is on our website as well. So with that, I will transition over to our Director of Transportation, Nuj Gupta, to um, introduce our fabulous team. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and uh, City Council. I'll keep this very brief so we can get the presentation rolling this evening. But I just wanted to thank you and the City Manager for uh, allowing us the opportunity to bring forward this vital work to you and the community tonight. This council spends a great deal of time and energy focused on public safety, and rightly so, as your top priority. And we are proud to share this work tonight as that we are leading uh, that squarely advances the priority of public safety, specifically the safety of our children, our families, our seniors, our people with disabilities, and all users of, users of our roadways in moving around our community, while advancing all of your priorities, including sustainability, of course, in the climate crisis, community connectedness, equity, and economic opportunity. So I'm very grateful to our mobility manager, Jason Klieger, for leading this work, along with our principal transportation planner, Kyle Kozar, whose team is responsible for the projects that you'll be hearing about tonight. So with that, I'll hand it off to Jason. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Jason Klieger, your mobility manager. Thank you for this opportunity to present, and thank you for the introduction, Anuj. And um, I want to reiterate that I'm joined here tonight by Kyle Kozar, who leads the team that does this incredible work. Tonight, I'll be reviewing the policy foundation for our mobility projects, our impact, and current and upcoming projects. But first, I'll start by reviewing the challenges that we are addressing with this work and how it aligns with the Council's strategic priority areas. First and foremost, a clean and safe Santa Monica is a council priority, and this extends to our largest public space asset, our public right-of-way. Between 2015 and 2019, only 5% of the crashes in Santa Monica were fatal or severe injury. Uh, however, 65% of those involved the most vulnerable road users, those walking and biking. A sustainable and connected community is another council priority. And to realize our climate goals, we need to focus on transportation, which is the largest emission sector in Santa Monica, accounting for 68% of our emissions. Preventing homelessness and community economic recovery are additional council priorities, and transportation is a major household expense. According to AAA, the annual cost to own and operate a car is over $14,000 a year. Additionally, 60% of Big Blue Bus customers are low income, and just over one in 10 households in Santa Monica do not own a car. So we are working to provide access to opportunity for people across the economic spectrum. Both the public right-of-way and private development are rapidly changing in Santa Monica, and our infrastructure needs to meet the demands that are being placed on it. Whether it's a new mixed-use development, it's new parklets, or managing the increased amount of deliveries that have uh, occurred in recent years, these changes require coordination to make sure that all users have access uh, to the public right-of-way safely. And lastly, the best practices in roadway design are ever-evolving, which allows us to make use of new features to keep our community safe. Change is always difficult, and it can take time to adjust to new ways of navigating our roadways. 
And that is why we have such a laser focus on outreach and education as we deli deliver these projects. So to address these challenges, our mobility projects are guided by four primary goals. First, we're working to convert 50% of local trips to active modes of transportation. We have a commitment to Vision Zero, which is eliminating fatal and severe injury crashes from our roadway network. We are building a complete and connected network of options so that you can get around the community regardless of the mode that you are using. And we are working to create all-inclusive designs that accommodate people of all ages and uh, abilities as well. There are a number of adopted plans, four are on the screen right now, that guide our work and support these policy goals. I'm not going to go into all of them uh, tonight, but each plan went through an extensive community engagement process, and each plan has a list of specific projects to provide people-scaled, safe transportation options. In a minute, I'm going to shift to highlight our various projects, but first, I want to take a moment to take stock of how we're doing. Uh, so this data on the screen shows the um, commute trends for Santa Monica residents. Um, the top line in the pink is the walk commuters and the bottom line is the bike commuters. And you can see that both are in an upward trajectory over the last decade plus. And while walking and biking trips are increasing, we are seeing that overall crash trends are going down. Um, including what's on the screen here is bikes involving pedestrians and cyclists. However, while overall crashes are going down, the trend line for fatal and severe injury crashes is quite variable. Some years are better than others, and we are committed to advancing the following projects to get us to that goal of zero. I want to briefly touch upon the process we go through for these projects. So once a challenge is identified, we research how to address it through a study or a planning effort. We leverage those plans that are created to secure funding, usually in the form of grants from Metro or Caltrans, and combine those with local funding sources like our transportation impact fee, uh, also known as the TIF. Then the project goes into design, and there's usually around five rounds of review um, to get to the 100% design. Once that's complete, we then hand those plans over to our colleagues in the Public Works Department to bid those plans and then manage the construction contract. Uh, these projects are constantly being improved, which is why we have that feedback loop at the end of the chart there. Sometimes we implement something like the pilot protected bike lanes on Broadway and then hear from the community and make changes as we recently did. Um, other times we learn and then take those learnings and employ them in future projects. And un engagement is the foundation and through line for all of this work. And throughout the process, we are engaging with the community and plan development and design development um, and discussing trade-offs. And those stakeholders, of course, include the council and the city manager's office, boards and commissions, other departments, community groups, uh, including residents, workers, and visitors, and, and community-based organizations as well. And when we create a project scope, we're looking to incorporate as many possible solutions along a corridor as we can, um, given the funding available. And we work to coordinate with our public works colleagues on projects that they have going on so that we can align work and take advantage of cost savings by coming in and putting in new roadway markings uh, after a road is repaved so that we can um, realize those efficiencies. This approach allows us to create projects that have multiple safety measures that work together to improve the right of way for the most users. Uh, this image is from 17th Street, which includes enhancements for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as enhancements for drivers, because increased visibility and a more organized traffic flow reduce conflicts and the chances of crashes and hitting someone and, and the consequences that come with that. So this map shows our current docket of mobility projects. There are about 18 projects that are underway or just recently completed. And this map overlays all of the other unfunded projects from our various plans 
um, that we've created over the years. There are about 50 additional projects that we have, um, we're working on prioritizing and finding funding opportunities for. So as projects are completed, we have new projects to come in and fill the gap. We're always looking for grant funding, and um, though I should say that uh, not all projects shown on this list will be competitive for certain grants given the funding requirements. So let's review our recently and up, uh, recently completed and upcoming projects. The Safe Streets for 17th Street and Michigan Avenue project had a festive ribbon cutting back in December, and this project includes a protected bikeway, protected intersections, mini traffic circles along Michigan Avenue, and pedestrian scale lighting. On Ocean Avenue, we upgraded the COVID era tactical bike lanes to concrete curb protection. We also upgraded crosswalk markings, and we were able to add about 75 parking spaces back to that corridor. When we created our first Vision Zero plan, we found that the entire stretch of Wilshire Boulevard and four intersections on Wilshire Boulevard were part of our priority network. And so we leveraged that research to obtain a grant to conduct a um, community engagement process around the Wilshire Boulevard safety study and also do a deep dive into the crashes to understand what was causing them and how to eliminate them. And so we are now in the process of rolling out the plan in three phases and the first phase was recently completed. And here's one great example that I think really shows how this plan is rooted in data. We implemented right turn only restrictions from the unsignalized side streets onto Wilshire Boulevard because those, uh, by eliminating, uh, excuse me, by putting in those restrictions, we eliminated the cause of about 25% of the crashes that were happening along the corridor. Um, we also added flashing beacons at five crosswalks and enhanced signing and striping on the corridor. The 4th Street Phase 2 project is almost complete and so far has made walking between Sam High, the Civic Center, and the downtown E-Line station more pleasant with a new crosswalk, as well as leading pedestrian intervals and fencing over the freeway bridge to make that more comfortable. We're working on the fourth phase of the Michigan Avenue Neighborhood Greenway, or Mango, uh, to reunite the two discontinuous portions of Michigan Avenue that were bisected when the freeway was constructed. Uh, notably, this project includes a new pathway that you can see here in this image between 20th and 21st Streets, just south of Crossroads School, as well as a protected two-way bike path along the 20th Street Bridge. Um, and there are many more projects underway. So we, the first two on the screen there we, we just discussed. Um, the next three uh, are all within the Bergamont area and include a lot of components, including the building of missing sidewalks on Olympic Boulevard and Pennsylvania Avenue, adding a missing crosswalk at the intersection of Olympic and 26th Street, adding protected bike lanes on Stewart Street between Colorado and Kansas Avenues, as well as on 26th Street between Broadway and Olympic Boulevard. The Six Schools Project will build 25 curb extensions and 71 curb ramps at various public school campuses in Santa Monica. The East Pico study is underway and community engagement has begun and will eventually design and construct quick build low cost interventions on the portions of that boulevard east of 27th Street. The Colorado and Broadway protected bikeways are entering construction later this year and early next and will provide superior east-west bikeways connecting downtown Santa Monica with uh, neighborhoods to the east as well as to uh, further east of the city. Wilshire Phase 2 includes a new traffic signal at 16th Street and a new traffic signal at Chelsea. The one at 16th Street um, should begin construction later this year. It will also harden the paint and post curb extensions that were put in with phase one with um, at five additional intersections. And finally, we are in the procurement now for the Santa Monica Boulevard safety study, which will replicate the work that we did on Wilshire with the community on the Santa Monica Boulevard corridor. So next steps, uh, we're gonna keep working on delivering the projects that we're currently working on. 
We're going to continue to identify funding sources for the next round of mobility projects, and then we're going to prepare the grant applications to make us competitive for those. And finally, we're going to continue the education and the outreach with the community to promote these projects and, um, and deliver this suite of projects. So in conclusion, we're dedicated to ensuring the safety and sustainability of every journey in Santa Monica, from pedestrians and cyclists to drivers and transit riders. Our goal is to reduce emissions, prioritize sustainable modes of transportation, and work tirelessly towards a future with zero fatal and severe injury crashes. Through community engagement and thoughtful design, we're building a city where transportation is safe, friendly, and environmentally conscious. And if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to sign up for our monthly newsletter at the QR code on the screen. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we'll take questions from the council. Are there any? And I see none. No. No, I do see. I'm sorry. I didn't look at my screen. Uh, council Member Davis. Okay. Yeah, you've got council members with enterosis as well, if you want to start with them. Oh. They didn't show up on my screen. I apologize. Uh, Council Member Tarosis, you're up first. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. No specific question, but I just wanted to. Sorry, there's a lot of feedback. Is there any? <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of your work. Um, I know that many residents in the community have uh, approached me, um, and I want to relay this to the entire department, just in thanking you uh, profusely and incredibly for the direct and swift work that you've done already. Um, I think that we've made incredible progress. I'm excited for the additional progress that we're going to make. I know this work is hard. I know you're understaffed. Um, I just personally want to say thank you, and I just also wanted to let you know how many um, folks have, have reached out to me, just letting me know that it's already making a huge and improved difference for their kids, for safe routes to school, for biking, for walking, um, your work matters. Uh, I really, really appreciate it um, and great presentation. Thank you. Council Member Zwick. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, Excuse me, getting my stuff together. Uh, I want to reiterate um, what Councilmember Trois has says, um, said. Uh, Santa Monica is unparalleled, I think, in the region when it comes to this work, and I'm really excited to keep building on it. Uh, to that, uh, that said, I'll ask some questions about how we can do better. Um, with the uh, one action, one part that you outlined um, was the uh, bike action plan amendment, which outlined a network of protected bike lanes, um, many of which were included in what was an ambitious five-year vision on a protected network. How long ago was this plan enacted? The plan was adopted in 2020 in October. So according to the plan, it should be complete by 2025? According to the plan. What percentage of the plan would you say will be complete by that time? Uh, I don't have a percentage. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so here's the map. Um, we kind of doing some mental calculation in here. So, um, you know, by 2025, 20, October 25-ish, we should have, you know, Broadway well underway, if not complete, Colorado. Um, 23rd Street is in. Stewart Street is entering construction later next year. Part uh, 26th Street should be built, um, you know, by then. Ocean is in, though not those full extents. Um, and 17th Street is in. So the, the ones that remain really are uh, extending Ocean, the Pico stretch, uh, Pearl, 6th, 11th, 14th. Um, so yeah. Um, is there any way, um, what are the primary constraints to moving faster? Uh, the, the primary constraints, resources. So um, one is, is having the funding available for grant match, um, let alone building it you know, on our own without a grant, um, and as well as having the, the staff capacity to, to manage additional projects. All right. 
Well, I, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing on this, and I know there's been a lot of headwinds, both financial, um, legal, bureaucratic, and otherwise. Um, and, and I just want to say that obviously we heard from a lot of people whose whose life you know depends on, on this this work. So I want to make sure that even in the face of all these headwinds, that we are thinking creatively about how we can circumvent these many obstacles as best we can um, as we go forward. There's one other question area I had, um, which pertains to another part of the plan that I was reading about in the Vision Zero document pertaining to a network of neighborhood greenways, uh, low stress routes that parallel busier corridors and connect to parks, schools, jobs, and services. Um, my understanding of the best way to effectuate this is by employing diverters or other modal filters at select intersections that divert car traffic off of local residential streets and thereby prevent dangerous cut through traffic up on smaller streets that then could be turned neighborhood greenways. Does the city have a program of designing and implementing diverters or other mobile filters? We evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis in project development and design, but we do not have a proactive program where we're specifically looking for places to add diverters on their own. I feel like as we plan for the future, I know we have so many unfunded plans, but um, to me, I don't see how we can really realize neighborhood greenways or these low-stress routes or car light streets without thinking about how to incorporate that into our arsenal of tools. Um, and then lastly, I just hear a lot from residents about the uh, issue of speed bumps. Uh, residents want them often on streets where people drive too fast, most notably on Nielsen Way, but also many other streets. But I hear our city no longer builds speed bumps as a matter of policy. Is that true, and why is that? Oh, the city has not implemented a new speed hump in at least 15 years or more, uh, primarily due to concerns about the impact that those speed humps have to emergency response times. Is that uh, sort of... I don't know, I mean, I see other jurisdictions employing speed bumps. I saw, you know, there were several that were installed on Long Island Drive in the last month to deter speeding on that street. I mean, is this like a judgment call, or, or how, how do these decisions get determined? Um, you know, we, we work with our... Uh, yeah, no, so there is a current work effort that we're, you know, trying to uh, work with the fire department to modify existing speed humps on a certain corridor in the community with a cut through in the middle so that fire apparatus can uh, basically straddle these speed humps and not have their uh, response times impacted. Um, once we develop that and implement that and test that, if there is um, you know, agreement and buy-in with our sister departments, then we can explore creating a program where we would be able to modify existing humps and potentially deploy new ones with the new design. Um, that work is, you know, taking time and, you know, I don't want to overpromise about where that will result, but that is what I see as the critical path towards getting uh, the ability to put in more speed humps in Santa Monica. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important work because obviously response times are very important, but so are slowing down cars. So um, I love those two forms of public safety not to be in conflict, but rather um, to, to be able to coexist. Um, finally, we heard a lot from, elect, uh, from pedicab um, bicyclists today and also on previous meetings about the possibility of electrification of pedicabs. Has the department looked at this at all or thought about it at all um, when it comes to mobility or transportation? So yeah, when we made the change a couple of years ago to allow pedicabs to operate on the beach bike path in the first place, council was very clear at that time that they did not want electric or motorized scooter or, uh, pedicab devices. Um, and so that is why that uh, was not included. Um, since that time, we have not investigated this or, or done any additional research, um, but, but we certainly could if council wanted to direct us uh, to pursue that. When you looked at it as staff the first time, was there any reason to, to, to not allow, say, e-bikes, um, you know, as pedicabs, or was that just a sort of, you know, was it based on any research or brought by staff in any way, or was it just a preference of council? 
I think the concern was that these are much larger vehicles with more mass and so operating at a higher speed with all of the things that happen on the path that that would present a, a dangerous you know cocktail of, of things um, you know we do allow uh, and there was a period of time where we didn't allow uh, e-bikes on the path at all um, but that has since been changed uh, to allow certain classes of e-bikes that can only go up to a certain speed um, and so you know I don't have a, more of an answer for you than that okay well thank you so much thank you Jesse uh, council member Davis and I want to remind everyone that we are now an hour and five minutes behind schedule thank you Well, with that reminding, I'll try to be brief. Um, so thank you again for the report. I, I want to echo what my colleague said because I think, you know, we all talk about uh, safety as being, you know, the three E's, education, enforcement, and engineering. And obviously tonight is part of that education process, learning about what's going on in the city. Um, but let me follow up a little bit with what Council Members Wick said about uh, e-bikes. I was here when we discussed banning e-bikes, um, e-pedicabs, and also Class 3 e-bikes from the uh, the beach bike path. And I, I do remember the concern being the speed of those bikes. And I'm just wondering, now that we've had some experience, and, and that was really right after we had opened the extension of the beach bike path, which is why we wanted to make it more available. I'm just wondering, is it something we're thinking about rather than sort of wholesale banning e-bikes or e-pedicabs, putting a speed limit on them? Because I think speed was really one of the concerns. You know, when I've been out on that bike path, uh, yeah, sometimes there are folks speeding, but sometimes there are folks speeding on human-powered cabs. You've got people like Doug Sloan over there. <laughs> go very, I'm not saying he personally, but we have people who are, you know, very athletic and they go very fast on the bikes. And so I'm just wondering, is there a way, different way to approach it instead of banning certain types of equipment to look at delimiters like speed, that sort of thing? Um. I know that we've talked about a speed limit on the path in the past, and it has never been implemented. That's something we would have to you know, sharpen our pencils on and, and go back to the desk, and we can follow up with you on that. OK, great. Thank you. And then the other thing, uh, talking about the second E, enforcement. We actually have a lot of good laws and good infrastructure in this city. Um, but that can't be a substitute for enforcement. We saw a video tonight, and I've certainly personally observed it, where you see cars parking in the bike lanes, which of course then force the cyclist to go out dangerously into traffic. You see uh, 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 vehicles ignoring the daylighting rules, parking too close to the curb so that people coming through the intersection can't see cross traffic. Um, you know, and, and so I'm wondering, I know you're not the enforcement folks, so I'm not laying that on you, but do you have ongoing discussions with the folks who are about how do we enforce, you know, we, we spent all this money building the infrastructure, <clears throat> you know, whether it's laying down the paint, putting in the bike lanes, whatever, you know, have you had discussions about how we then go about enforcing the rules for the use of that? I mean, I was just literally on Ocean Park yesterday and some people got impatient where it's one lane and they literally used the bike lane as a second lane of traffic to get to a right turn lane, you know, which would have been very dangerous if there'd been a cyclist in there and maybe they hadn't have seen them. So, so do you have ongoing conversations about enforcement efforts with regard specifically to cycling and pedestrian safety infrastructure? Yeah, we do. Um, as directed by council, actually, a 16 item in November, um, we have since that time begun ongoing monthly meetings between DOT, PD, and the Office of Communications um, to, you know, coordinate our work. Um, and we're also exploring the potential of doing a pilot program to use cameras to do um, monitoring of bike lanes. Um, it wouldn't be issuing any citations, but it's just kind of testing the technology to see if there's promise here in Santa Monica. Right, and it would be a way to gather information about what might be the more dangerous intersections and where if we wanted to put our resources to do enforcement. That sounds great. I'm really and, supportive of and that. And then, Councilman, I just wanted to add, I know that the Chief's been working with uh, Department of Transportation Mobility team on bringing 
training into the department to educate uh, particular new officers that come on board about what our plans are. And then I think also maybe going to um, roll call briefings as well to help educate on all of the plans we have in terms of extending in the bike lane network that we've built out for that very purpose. Great, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then we had a comment from one of the speakers how um, cyclists don't stop for stop signs. My observation is that cars don't stop for stop signs either. Um, and that sort of goes to that whole enforcement idea. I mean, everybody, you know, actually, I know there's some state laws because Idaho stops, which say if there's no oncoming traffic, cyclists can roll through. But I mean, I think that, you know, what's good for the sauce for the goose is good for the gander or whatever that phrase is. And so, you know, I would, I would just comment here again, knowing you're not the enforcement person, that it seems to me, um, enforcing the rules for people stopping at stop signs, particularly when they're driving three ton cars, <laughs> is probably a good thing because no matter, of course, uh, who's violating the law in any collision between a car and a pedestrian or a car and a cyclist, we know who's going to get the worst of it. Um, and that goes to my next question, which is we also know that the chances of surviving an interaction between a, a car and a pedestrian or a car and a cyclist are speed. Have we given any thought to reviewing speed limits on our streets? Because if we slow speeds, there is a greater chance of survivability should there be an unfortunate interaction. Yeah, thank you for that question. We are in the midst of our what's called an engineering and traffic survey. Um, that is basically our speed survey, and so that's prescribed by state law. We'll be bringing that to council sometime around June, July of this year to establish new speed limits uh, citywide. Great, glad to hear it. I hope you meant to say slower speed limits citywide, but. I didn't say just... faster, did I? <laughs> Um, just a couple more questions. One is you had a whole list of future projects coming. Um, I know Lincoln Boulevard was not up there. Um, can you give us some idea about what's going on on Lincoln Boulevard? Because we've had, sadly, some unfortunate interactions there, including a pedestrian death recently. Yeah, so we have some surgical treatments coming along to Lincoln Boulevard from that are being led by the Department of Transportation. So the intersection of Lincoln and Ocean Park Boulevards will be seeing some changes to organize the traffic flow there. That was one of our top 10 priority intersections from the first Vision Zero plan. Um, and I think the reason it wasn't on the map is because it's actually being let, the, the greater link project that was defunded a few years ago um, that we're working to deliver is being led by our public works partners. So it does include some of these mobility goals and um, some bike treatments to cross the boulevard and, and other um, aspects. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I know that there has been some money that's been received from various sources to roll out components of that project. I know that we don't have all the money to roll out the full project that was originally envisioned, so it's going to be implemented in phases. Great, I appreciate that. And my next question is just looking for some reassurance. We know that Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg has made Vision Zero one of his top priorities. And so I'm assuming the DO, the federal DOT, not our local DOT, um, is putting out grants. And I, can you just reassure me that we're monitoring those and looking for ones that might be appropriate for projects here in Santa Monica? Absolutely. We are always keeping our ear to the ground. We had a meeting earlier today about some potential funding sources. Uh, we're working with some outside partners to uh, submit another grant that actually would uh, help with the uh, uh, building the 14th Street protected bike lane uh, portion of it that's, that's on the map on the screen. Um, if that hasn't been submitted already, it's about to be submitted. And so we're always keeping our, um, you know, our options open in that way. Well, great. And thank you to you and staff for the wonderful report. I appreciate it. Delatory. Uh, thank you and staff, you know, for um, your report. Uh, really great seeing all the protected bike lanes. So I want to definitely uh, support that. There was a video that a gentleman showed uh, in public comment where, you know, the cars were going into the bike lane. And it just seems like the engineering is not, not the best because you have a protected bike lane and, and if they can't, if they're not watching. Uh, are we addressing all those and is it data driven where we're looking at where more accidents are happening and, and we can make some changes there as, as to prioritize that? 
Uh, yeah, so the protected bike lane network that was adopted by council, it's on the screen, was uh, developed with safety and crash history in mind, as well as, you know, connections to destinations and making sure that our schools and parks and communities are well served. Um, and then we are using our Vision Zero data analysis that we're updating every five years or so to prioritize where our next, you know, suite of projects will be focused. Great. And in terms of, uh, I heard someone made a comment about alleys being a little dangerous. Do, do we envision striping alleys and 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 and, lo and looking into that or? Um, so, well, the biggest thing that we're doing with alleys as it pertains to bikeways is making sure that there's better daylighting and visibility at the places where those alleys intersect with the street so that, um, you know, it's safer and that people can see oncoming traffic and uh, cyclists can see the cars coming out of the alley. Great. Well, that's all I had. Thank you very much. I think Santa Monica is on the right path. And uh, one one idea I want to add, um, you know, in terms of like slowing down traffic, there's a, a number of car clubs, ca classic car clubs here in Santa Monica. And I was having a conversation with one of them. One of the leaders talked about a slow and low campaign. You know, if, if the city can partner with these classic cars, every time they drive around, everybody pays attention. Maybe there's a, a slogan, a, can, a banner, or something that they can do to, to encourage everybody to slow down in Santa Monica. Thank you very much. Okay, I have uh, two quick comments, and then we'll go to our city attorney in a minute. Uh, first, on the uh, speed humps or bumps or whatever you want to call them on Nielsen Way. That's something I've been working on for over a year and a half now, uh, as you know. And we're very concerned about that. I'm, I'm sad that we haven't had more progress on it. Uh, Venice, our contiguous neighbor in LA, uh, on Pacific has speed bumps uh, all along there. So, and that is one of the major routes for their fire trucks and ambulances as they come to Santa Monica. So I know it can be done. The residents in the uh, various towers there and uh, people on Main Street continue to see loud noise, racing, et cetera. I know we have asked the police department to enforce speeding and uh, noise for cars on that street, but the speed bumps there would be very, very helpful and would just join the bumps that are already on Pacific just south of the Santa Monica city limit. That seems like a natural. Uh, if we just indeed match the speed humps on Pacific and LA. Uh, second thing, uh, you know, for, oh my God, 22 years, uh, when I first joined Recreation and Parks, we were concerned about the bike path and very concerned about the area between, at that time, Bay, where Council Member McEwen had fallen or been hit by another bike. I had been hit by a bike there as well, and uh, the north side of the pier. When I go to Manhattan Beach or Hermosa Beach, uh, they both have eight mile an hour speed limits on their bike path uh, in those critical areas by their pier, et cetera. And Hermosa Beach has now put a serpentine route in and put bars across some of the bike paths so you have to slow down. They also, uh, the Manhattan Beach Pier, have flashing lights that tell you during summer season, you must dismount there. And I've seen police standing there giving tickets. So I'm gonna ask once again, that we slow the speed, especially around the pier, uh, on the bike path, because people going under the pier at the north side from the 1550 lot, they walk across traffic to get on the pier. It's always been dangerous there. So I'm gonna ask once again, that we establish an eight mile an hour speed limit, that we consider dismount rules uh, during those peak hours, let's say weekends during the summer as well, to make sure the safety of pedestrians and other bicycles are not compromised there. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn to, thank you so much for your report and your time. Uh, we're now an hour and 19 minutes behind. So uh, you need to call the next item. Thank you, Clerk. Yes, closed session. We have three closed session items tonight. Uh, item 4A, consider appointment of unrepresented employee. The unrepresented employee is city clerk, interim city clerk. The city negotiator is the mayor. Item 4B, um, 
We have an existing litigation, Pico Neighborhood Association and Maria Loya versus the City of Santa Monica. And item 4C, existing litigation, uh, Daniel Regosa versus Charles Seta, Grant, and others. So on time estimate, I think we're shooting for 45 minutes, so 9.05. Okay, and we apologize to the public. We have to go to closed session, and we'll be back as soon as we can. If we go past 9.05, we'll try and make an announcement. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a while, everyone. Grab your frozen TV dinners and then come back to TV.
three minute history.
Yeah. We're missing. We're missing the city manager, assistant city managers. Oh, Christine's missing. Yeah, Christine. Christine. Yeah, Christine. Christine. tonight okay and uh, I want to take a minute um, our vice mayor uh, Lana Fernandez Negretti has asked if she can have two minutes my of our there. time um, okay um, this is especially important for me um, and I will admit that I did not know that February was National Cancer Prevention Month until now um, many of you may know already, as I've been very vocal, I was just recently diagnosed with cancer, and so um, I am going to be using my platform as much as possible um, to be vocal about all things um, surrounding um, cancer. So National Cancer Prevention Month was first observed in 2014 and has since been recognized every February. The goal is to educate the public about the importance of cancer prevention and early detection. According to the American Cancer Society, about 1.8 million new cancer cases are expected to be diagnosed in the U.S. in 2024. However, studies have shown that up to 50% of cancer cases and deaths are preventable through healthy lifestyle choices <clears throat> and early detection. By raising awareness and promoting healthy habits, the National Cancer Prevention Month aims to reduce the number of cancer um, cases and deaths in the future. So my personal message to you out there is um, ladies, get your mammograms and advocate for yourself. Young ladies and boys, um, know your body <clears throat> and advocate for yourself. Guys, get your prostate checks. <laughs> Everybody check your colon. Um, no, but in all seriousness, I think it's uh, really important that we listen to our bodies, we show up to our doctor's appointments when we can, and um, everybody stay safe and healthy, and hopefully we can prevent more cases like myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we wish you the absolute best in this fight, and we know, Vice Mayor Negretti, that you are a fighter. That's right. And you will beat this. So. Uh, I'll have lots of fun wigs, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay. So, I may I can borrow one of them. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, we have our historical moment now, courtesy of the Santa Monica Conservancy and the History Museum. Yes, we did. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. No, so, please. if we could, everyone pay attention to the video screen for two minutes or so. Thank you. Welcome to the Santa Monica 3-Minute History Series. Today, we will talk about the Rapp Saloon at 1436 2nd Street. William Rapp was a buyer at Santa Monica's first land auction in July 1875. By October, he completed the town's first brick building and opened a saloon. The bricks were fired on site from local clay. Soon, Rapp bought the lot next door to add a beer garden. In 1887, the newly incorporated city began requiring $300 liquor licenses, a small fortune. Rapp shut down his saloon rather than pay, becoming a landlord instead. Santa Monica Town Trustees held their first meetings at a hotel. In May 1888, after two intervening moves, the Rapp building became the fourth town hall. Rapp was honored. But eight months later, the trustees moved on to the Santa Monica Bank Building on 3rd Street. Disappointed, Rapp asserted thereafter that the Rapp Saloon had been the city's first town hall. The Vitagraph Company became the first movie outfit in town, leasing both Rapp parcels from 1913 to 1915. Photography took place outdoors in the sunlight. Home to their dark room, the windows of Rapp's brick building were painted over. By 1920, the locus of downtown had moved to 3rd Street. 
Second Street, including the Rapp Building, was home to automotive uses through the 1930s. To accommodate cars, the doorway of the Rapp Saloon was widened and elongated. From 1942 to 1962, a piano tuner rented the Rapp Building. He told its history on the facade in curly Q lettering made of piano wire. The year 1873, only two years off, rose above the roof and past uses were listed on the brick. The Rapp family sold the property in 1963 and demolition of the historic saloon was proposed. Envisioning it as a history museum, City Council began a protracted search for a relocation site. The 100-year-old Rapp Saloon became the first designated city landmark in August 1975. In 1984, with funding but no final site identified, the city prepared to move the rat building to storage. At the 11th hour, American Youth Hostels purchased the rat land on the advice of employee and city planning commissioner Ken Genzer. The youth hostel they built embraces the rat saloon, which was faithfully restored to its original as built appearance, serving as a meeting hall for the facility to this day. Every meeting. Welcome to the Santa Monica Three Minute History. Thank you. We don't need to repeat it, but uh, for everyone in the city, I, I have put it one of the cornerstones of my year as mayor as making sure we expose our past history and culture in the city. So the Rap Saloon still exists on Second Street. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the city council doesn't get to uh, drink at their meetings, and we're no longer at the Rap Saloon. But please, pay attention to these and look around your city. There is 148 years right now, almost 149 years of culture in Santa Monica and history. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I will now ask if any council members have any reports on travel since our last meeting. Yes, I attended the United States Conference of Mayors Leadership uh, meeting last Friday and Saturday in Goleta, California. There were 50 mayors from throughout the nation present. Uh, Friday's session was exclusively on three topics during the nine hours of the day, uh, public safety, homelessness, and mental health. Uh, the mayors, uh, it was a really great session uh, with mayors from all over America. Uh, all of us got to speak and uh, talk about the problems in our city and, and the help we needed in crafting solutions. Uh, Mayor Bass is our larger neighbor next door. She also attended. I thought it was extremely beneficial. Saturday morning uh, was two and a half hours on artificial intelligence. And uh, knowing that I needed some intelligence, I stayed for that meeting on Saturday morning. And actually, the experts that were there really gave me a lot more understanding of AI. So it, it was extremely productive. Uh, there was uh, no cost for mayors to attend. Thank you very much. Are there any other council members have any? We'll now move on to the consent calendar. All items will be considered and approved in one motion unless removed by a council member for discussion in accordance with Charter Section 615. The adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of title only unless a council member present dissents. Mm -hmm. No discussion is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. Oh. And uh, Hold on one minute. Do we have public comment before this that I just skipped over? No, it's after this. Oh, okay. Last time I listened to you. <laughs> do we have a motion? To, do we have a second? Second. And you can call for a vote. Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Mayor Pochen Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Rapara? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. 
That passes unanimously. We're now moving on to public input on remaining agenda items only. Public comment is permitted on ordinances for introduction and first reading. No discussion is permitted on ordinance for second reading and adoption. And it looks like we have about eight speakers for this item. And I'm going to go out of order a little bit. We do have a student here, uh, Charlotte. I'm sorry, I can't see her. Barrett? Yes. And then I'm going to call a few more names to line up behind Ms. Barrett. Clerk, sorry. Is it possible to have the person who's accompanied her go right after her, Erin and Atsugu? Yeah, we can. I'm sorry. Uh, Aaron, yeah, that's fine. That's her ride home. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Denise Barton, Harvey Etter and Lori Brown. You may begin. Uh, good evening, Santa Monica City Council. I am one of the choir co-presidents at Samo High. My name is Charlotte Barrett. This year, our program was given an amazing opportunity to perform in cathedrals and venues across Spain. The last time we were able to have a tour like this was five years ago, in which Samo High Choir was the last group to perform in the Notre Dame Cathedral before it burnt down. This year, our singers are working around the clock to prepare and memorize an hour's worth of music for our performances. As you can imagine, this trip is costly and we want to ensure that everyone can travel to Spain. Our volunteers have held numerous fundraisers like our concert auction in the fall and our students got local restaurants such as Rosti's on Montana and Handel's Ice Cream on Ocean Park to provide funding and promotions for our program. We appreciate the support of our donors, especially the city of Santa Monica, who have supported our students' travels in the past. We are so thankful that we live in a city that values the arts and provides us with world-class opportunities like this. Your support is so meaningful for us so that regardless of the financial status of our students, we can continue singing together and making powerful music to share with the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next is, um, I'm sorry, Aaron and Nagatsu. Inatsugu, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Erin Inatsugu. I am the volunteer chair of the steering committee supporting the choir program at Samo High. For the first time since 2019, as you heard, we are working to provide the students in our advanced choirs with the once in a lifetime chance to travel together to Spain and perform in stunning historical cathedrals in Barcelona, Burgos, and Madrid, where their concerts are sure to be a beautiful testament to arts education in Santa Monica. Your support of these opportunities speaks to the importance and impact of a caring community in bettering the lives of our young people. I want to note that this year's group of seniors were just freshmen in 2020 during the pandemic when they entered the choir program that fall during distance learning, doing school and choir on Zoom and unsure of what that future held for them. Thanks to their dedication, here we are today, looking toward ensuring access to every student and asking for your assistance with a matching funds grant. Um, we are asking for an amount of $20,000, but do realize that the amount being considered before you is at $15,000. We are appreciative of any amount that you can lend, and I want you to know that the need is very great this year. We are working harder than we have before, um, post-pandemic, and with many students in great need. So we appreciate your consideration to help make this possible for all of that all of those students and on behalf of all of the parents of the program we really thank you for your consideration thank you thank you so much go Vikings Denise Barton good evening on item 11 B so many things to touch on starting with your optimistic attitude about the city's financial position although you forgot to mention the 2020 riot and continued lack of safety, there it is again. So how can you continue doing the same thing and expect different results? Have you looked on the internet about visiting Santa Monica and if it's safe? There were many websites besides the ones about the Santa Monica Coalition sign that had common themes, the homeless, acknowledgement of crime and a dirty beach, with most of them being from 2023. You have technically bankrupted the city, yet you continue starving the city of funds by denying safety through law and order. Why would you think the transit occupancy tax is going to get better? A hope, maybe? Due to the homeless having control of the city doesn't reflect a friendly place to vacation, and I've heard stories of events that will never be held here again. For the grant funding for seniors and the disabled for the Housing Authority, those funds should be used for an ADA person, not a plan unless the plan is to, for the discrimination to continue. 
Also, the city does not have the best record of paying loans back, in addition to wanting more staff and higher pay for city staff and city hall, showing to me that you are willing to gamble the city's finances. Then I guess you don't realize your travel funds are taxpayer funds that should be returned, not rolled over. And considering the Human Services Grant Program staff follow up their job, it doesn't do their job, resulting in the people concerned having a $1.4 million in grant funding unaccounted for, I wouldn't think giving you more funding in that area is a good idea due to the city's dysfunctionality and financial irresponsibility. You can refer to my earlier public input if you have to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Harvey Etter. Uh, Lori Brown. And Ms. Brown, before you get started, I'm going to call, I think, almost re the rest of the names I have. Um, Regina Ramirez. Uh, Michael Soloff. And Erica Leslie. You may begin. Before I get started tonight, I just want to wish um, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Vice Mayor, um, Lana Negretti, all the best in her journey. And I know that the community is supporting you. So with a heartfelt best of luck. Um, 10 o'clock tonight, I'm here talking about the budget. I want to tell you that it was not an easy time being chair of recreation and parks during the budget cuts, the slashing, and COVID. And I am so greatly appreciative of Jenny Rogers. She has brought to our commission a sense of unity, a sense of hope, and a sense of camaraderie that we didn't have during those difficult times. So I want to extend from our commission our support for her and what she's done, and then hope tonight, wait, let's hope that what I've written down doesn't go away. Um, I'm hoping that tonight we get a strong support so that we can restore the positions that were cut and it would allow us to bring recreation and arts staff back to our parks, community facilities, outdoor sports facilities, in support of our community programs, use permits, and bring back the crucial staff and reopen the Miles Playhouse and Camera Obscura and activate both indoor outdoor facilities, parks at Reed Palisades and all the parks throughout the city. I also want to thank everybody who's really been involved in trying to help Reed Park and really working with Jenny and welcoming her because we really, really needed it. Thank you for giving us a director of, 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 of what's the words that I can say? You know, I'm here at 10 o'clock at night because I could cry. She's amazing. Okay. So thank you so much for putting her on, on the staff and we look forward to working with her and getting these parks back open and running and hopefully having a safer community for all of our kids and residents. So thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, Commissioner. Michael Soloff. I speak tonight on behalf of me and my fellow official proponents of 2022 Measure GS and on behalf of SMUR as its co-chair. In 2022, 10,000 Santa Monicans signed petitions to place GS on the ballot so that its provisions, if adopted by the voters, would be binding on the city, not advisory. GS created new funding for the schools and affordable housing and required that that new funding be in addition to existing school and affordable housing funding. Five of you, the ones in the room here, placed competing measure DT on the 2022 ballot. DT contained only advisory spending priorities and stressed restoration of city services. DT did not include any school funding or any protections for existing school or affordable housing funding. The voters then spoke. DT failed, receiving just 34% of the vote, while GS passed with 53.5% of the vote. It's troubling then that the staff report for item 11B suggests that the city could stop a portion of existing school funding in 2027 and redirect that funding to city services. That is directly contrary to the voters' will and to the binding provisions of GS. It's also terrible public policy. Our high quality schools are critical in helping our community's children achieve their dreams, as you just heard, and they also support our high property values, which in turn generate city tax revenue. Each of you should declare tonight whether you will continue all existing school funding or instead will attempt to flout the voters' will and the law. Voters are entitled to know that now, prior to your standing for re-election in 2024 and 2026. Relatedly, in 2023, you diverted existing affordable housing monies to fund the Euler settlement, but you promised timely repayment. 
Please direct staff to advise whether any repayment has occurred to date and projections for when that repayment will occur so the voters are assured repayment promise is real. That is not in the staff report tonight. Thank you, Michael. And Erica Leslie. I'm here once again, not here, haven't left yet. Um, I'm here on behalf of our children for you to honor the promises that you've made to our future for Santa Monica, for our children are our future here. Please honor the master's facilities use agreement. Do not renege on what you have promised because our children are watching and you must instill in them a sense of integrity as you said that you would honor this agreement. You can't go back. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And that concludes public input for this evening. What's next? Okay. Um, clerk, we're going to have a special joint meeting of the City Council and Housing Authority. That is correct. And I just need to announce that um, the respective payment for this meeting will be $50 per member for per meeting. And I just need to verify if agency member Elizabeth Cochran is here. And uh, agency member Laurentino. Okay. So I will now call the roll. Authority member Cochran is absent. Authority member Laurentino is absent. Authority members Wick. Present. Authority member Para. Present. Authority member Davis. Here. Authority member Tarosis. I'm not here. Authority member De La Torre. Here. Chair Pro Tem Negrete. Here. And Chair Brock. Here. And our first uh, item is approval of the minutes for the Housing Authority meetings. If you've read the minutes, does anyone want to move that forward? So moved. Do, any discussion? Seeing none, let's do a roll call vote. I'm sorry, that was Vice Chair Negrete. I'm sorry, yes, and um, De La Torre? Yes. Uh, authority members Wick? What was that? Yes. Authority member Parr? Yes. Authority member Davis? Yes. Authority member, I'm sorry, Chair Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Authority member Tarosis? Yes. Authority member uh, De La Torre? Yes. And Chair Brock? Yes. Okay. Item 11B, financial status update and fiscal year 2023-2024 mid-year budget. Oscar, I'll do the presentation. I can advance over here or yeah. yeah. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm Oscar Santiago, your Finance Director. So tonight, I will provide you with an update of the five-year financial forecast that was presented to you in March of 2023. Um, but before I do so, um, we should talk about the climate that we're operating under, which continues to be volatile and uncertain. We've done our best to um, consider these external issues in our forecast. So recent trends show that inflation has cooled, but it's still not at the desired Fed Reserve target levels. Therefore, economists are projecting that high interest rates will remain unchanged until mid to late 2024. An example of how high interest rates impact our forecasts is through their effect on property taxes, real estate transfer tax, and development. High mortgage and other loan rates mean property owners hold back on um, selling or renovating, which is a key factor to the growth of assessed property value and property taxes. High loan rates also impact our business' ability to thrive and grow and impact borrowing costs for consumers and businesses, including mortgages, auto loans, credit cards, which impact consumer spending. 
While recent reports indicate that, the employment, that there are employment gains in the U.S., locally we continue to experience challenges with recruitment and our ability to retain staff. As we continue to compete for uh, filling our vacant positions with other agencies, we have to consider our salaries and benefits in order to stay competitive. All of this is making it difficult to run programs and operations, and it's also requiring us to adjust staffing structures as reflected by the position changes that were um, included in our mid-year budget. Additionally, our labor agreements expire in 2025, so there will be an expectation for us to consider our compensation and benefits in our upcoming labor negotiations. Our downtown restaurants and retail areas that rely on office workers are feeling the impact of fewer office workers because of telecommuting and also hybrid work schedules. This shift is also changing behavior patterns of parking activity, which is impacting our parking revenues. While some businesses like REI are closing in Santa Monica, new businesses continue to open up regularly. For example, 21 new businesses are opening up soon, eight in the promenade, three in Santa Monica Place, and 10 in the downtown. These are all factors influencing our sales tax and our parking revenue projections. Our tourism sector is recovering, but we have yet to see a strong return of business, group, and international travel. Santa Monica travel and tourism projects stronger growth starting in mid-2024 and reaching peak 2019 levels by late 2025, early 2026. Hotels like the Regent and Fairmont Marimar are temporarily closing for renovation. And all of this is impacting our transit occupancy tax, our hotel revenue. Our capital improvement program is severely underfunded, and we have a mounting backlog, backlog of uh, infrastructure maintenance projects, which continue to be deferred. Our maintenance schedules are deficient and unsustainable in areas such as alleys, sidewalks, street lights, technology, and building and park facilities. We also continue to be impacted by copper wire thefts which is an area that's un unfunded. Additionally, the current funding levels to maintain our uh, current urban tree canopy is not sufficient, and we are short-staffed in the urban forestry area. The city is pruning about 50% less trees than we were prior to the pandemic, and as a result, complaints about trees have more than doubled since 2021. Additionally, in our forecast, we also factor in for contingent liabilities. While we have already been impacted by some heavy legal settlements, we are facing additional liabilities from additional claims related to allegations of sexual abuse, litigation over a request to transition to district elections, and an urgent seismic retrofit project for parking structure one that comes at a cost of, of about 13 million. As you know, most of the city's services count on the general fund, which is funded mostly with tax revenues. And this for this reason, the most impacted by economic shifts. Over the past almost four years, we talked at length about the financial sacrifices that the general fund has had to make in response to the pandemic. These sacrifices have taken a toll on our ability to provide services and also threaten our ability to respond to another emergency. As of the end of last fiscal year, we estimate that the general fund has lost over 170 million in revenues due to the pandemic. During this time, the city also paid over 229.8 million in settlements of sexual abuse claims. A small portion of this was paid by our insurance funds, resulting in a net impact to the city of over 216.8 million. Of that amount, over 159.6 million was covered using general fund reserves. This slide provides some context around the sacrifice reserves. The general fund has had a long history of strong reserves that we have counted on to protect city, the city against emergencies and unanticipated costs. When we compare the non-restricted portion of the general fund at the end of last fiscal year to pre-pandemic times, we are about half of the previous levels. The orange um, portion of the chart shows the gap of where we were in 2018 to where we are now in, at the end of 20, uh, 2023. The decrease in reserves is concerning because reserves are needed for contingent liabilities, emergencies, and working capital to fill future year gaps when revenues are not sufficient to cover our costs. As it stands now, our reserve, levels are, our reserve levels are not sufficient given the volatility of our revenues. In addition to the use of general fund um, reserves, this slide shows the amount of funds borrowed by the general fund from other funds to address legal claims and impacts of the pandemic. 
As the general fund continues to recover, we will need to pay back this borrowed funds via the payment plan approved by council in October of 2023. Now let's discuss another challenge that continues. This graph shows our revenue projections on the eve of the pandemic, the line in orange, and where we find ourselves today instead, the re reflected in the line in blue. The space between the two lines reflects the loss of approximately 170 million in revenues um, through June of 2023. And we anticipate that an additional 34 million in lost revenues by 2627, uh, when revenues finally catch up. I'm showing you a dotted line, um, which is the projection in March of 2023, which was lower than our projection on revenues in the line in blue, our current um, projection. This is a signal that our revenues are continuing to improve, but we're still not there yet. The gap between the orange and the blue lines also explains our inability to restore programs and services to a level that meets current council priorities and, and community needs, even with the help of working capitals to help close the gap. An added challenge not shown here is that we have new needs now and also higher costs. So to me, that suggests that even if we had the revenues at the rates that we were expecting prior to the pandemic, we would likely not be able to bring forward programs and services at the same level that we had before. It's important for us to consider how inflation and higher costs constrain our ability to restore services to previous levels. So this slide illustrates a hypothetical example that if we had $100 in 2019 to pay for $100 in services due to inflation, it would cost us now $20 more uh, to pay for the same level of services that we were paying in 2019. This just shows you the impact of inflation. Now let's discuss the anticipated revenue growth uh, for the next five years. This slide shows the major revenue streams in the general fund and how we project them to grow during the forecast period. And these had been adjusted for mid-year changes. While we expect increased revenues as compared to what we budgeted in 23, 24, and 24, 25, we expect moderate growth beyond that. From fiscal year 25, 26 to fiscal year 28, 29, we're expecting an average annual growth across all revenues of merely 3.7%. The revenues that, were being, that are being adjusted as part of mid-year include transient occupancy tax, the line in orange. This um, shows uh, stronger growth as tourism recovers and as hotels that closed or will close for renovations reopen by the end of the forecast period. As interest rates moderate or are reduced, it is projected that there will be an increase in home sales and that prices, which are leveling off or declining, will rebound, increasing our uh, assessed property values. And this is reflected in our property taxes. Business license tax revenues are anticipated to increase by an average of 9.6% over the next two years, and then increase moderately over the forecast period. The increases are due to greater than projected gross receipts reported by businesses this year, which we anticipate will continue throughout the forecast. This is a sign again that our businesses are, are slowly recovering. Parking revenues, however, are projected to be significantly lower than we projected pri previously. And this is reflective of um, so the revenue growth uh, pre reflects an annual growth of approximately 1.75%. And this decrease is reflective of changing behaviors of uh, patterns of parkers, including the prevalence of telecommuting, hybrid schedules, the use of alternative modes of transportation by visitors to Santa Monica, and also the, the increased use of the free 90 minute parking in the parking structures. On the expenditure side, we have many challenges. In addition to the pending litigation and seismic upgrade liabilities that we've discussed, our current infrastructure replacement and maintenance schedules are deficient and unsustainable. And we cannot make additional investments in this area beyond pre-pandemic levels in the near future. The forecast reflects a significant increase in contributions to the self-insurance funds. And this is a, as a result of recommendations from our independent actuaries financial review last year of the position of the funds the recommendation was to right-size the general liability and auto insurance funds primarily to have sufficient resources to cover claim expenses, excess insurance premiums, and program overhead. Failure to do, do so would mean that um, it would threaten our annual operations, and it would mean that we would have to find uh, places from other funds from other places to re be reallocated. 
The forecast has also been updated for future pension contribution costs to make up for the pension fund's investment losses reported in fiscal year 21-22. One positive thing that we see on the pension front is that starting in 28-29, we are finally starting to see some leveling out of unfunded liability costs as CalPERS begins to close out amortization periods for the severe investment losses of the Great Recession. Also reflected in the forecast are health care costs increasing at an annual rate of 10% due to medical and prescription drug inflation. And additionally, we are still providing significant assistance to the pier and beach funds, which were badly impacted by COVID closures, loss of parking revenues, and in the case of the pier, future um, interruption while the pier bridge is constructed. Another factor underlying the forecast is that we are still severely underfunding our capital improvement program. Annual funding for our infrastructure, technology, and equipment replacement continues to be half of what it was, and we will not be able to reach uh, pre-pandemic funding levels until 25-26. We have over $358 million in unfunded projects, and our current replacement and maintenance schedules are deficient and unsustainable. The line in orange in this chart illustrates how inflation impacts our project costs, including equipment costs, building materials, and labor. Even when we bring our capital program, uh, our capital project funding to previous levels of 21 million in 25, 26, we roughly estimate that it would cost us over $5 million more just to pay for the same project costs that we were paying in fiscal year 20, uh, 1920. As shown in the previous chart, we expect that the capital improvement program will be funded at previous pre-pandemic levels of 21 million starting in 25-26. However, that funding is used for projects needed for basic maintenance, which has been deferred for a few years now, and to address equipment replacement needs, <clears throat> which means that very little will be left for major projects such as the parking structure one seismic retrofit, Memorial Park, and other community amenities. That means that we have 358 million in unfunded projects. This slide shows you a list of some of the major projects. Um, you also should note that we're in the process of developing our biannual capital improvement program budget, and so this unfunded list will likely grow as a result of that. Um, one thing that I also want to point out is that um, I think it's worth noting that our city and our infrastructure will be showcased and impacted by some large events that are coming to our region, such as LA28, uh, Summer Olympics, and the Paralympics Games and also the FIFA World Cup in 2026, which will be hosted in LA. This is another reason why we cannot continue to defer our critical infrastructure maintenance needs. As I mentioned to you previously, we have a mounting backlog of infrastructure maintenance projects, which continue to be deferred. Projects such as sidewalk repairs, maintenance of a right-of-way, streetlight maintenance, and impacts of copper wire thefts are some examples of critical projects that lack funding. So now that I've discussed the factors influencing the forecast, this chart shows you what the general fund forecast looks like. The chart shows revenues minus expenditures for the current budgeted fiscal year and over the next five years. With the help of working capital reserves, we managed to remain in the black throughout the forecast with revenue exceeding expenditures starting in 27-28. The dashed line in blue reflects the expiration of the Maxter Facility Use Agreement with the Santa Monica School District, which expires during the forecast period. So this forecast demonstrates the financial impacts to the city if the agreement expires as reflected by the dashed line. And then we have a second scenario in which the agreement is perpetuated based on the existing terms, which is the solid blue line. As I mentioned to you, while we are showing a relatively positive five-year forecast, this is only feasible because we are using working capital reserves to fill the gaps between revenues and expenditures to maintain a balanced budget. The working capital reserves that we are using were made possible from an earlier than expected recovery, which means that we saw higher revenues than originally budgeted in 21, 22, and 22, 23. Because we expect the revenue growth to moderate over the next few years, we set aside these working capital reserves to support operations as revenues continue to recover. This plan to use working capital funds to fill the gaps 
was also presented to Council at the March 2023 Council uh, Priority Setting Workshop. The chart that I'm showing um, reflects the forecasted expenditures, the red line, which are anticipated to exceed forecasted revenues, the green line, through fiscal year 26-27, with revenues ultimately catching up with expenditures in 27-28. It is important to note that although revenues catch up with current expenditures, we have a long way to go before the general fund has sufficient funding to address all pending needs, which I discussed uh, previously in my uh, previous slides. Aside from the general fund, several of our enterprise funds and special funds are self-sustaining in the future. Among them are water, RRR, Big Blue Bus, airport, and the housing authority fund. Our fleet fund is still awaiting full repayment of contributions that were deferred during the pandemic years. 4.1 million remains outstanding, even after payments included in the forecast for fiscal year 27, 28, and 28, 29. And as discussed earlier, the beach and pier funds are requiring general fund assistance during the forecast. <laughs> Finally, I want to summarize our forecast before moving on to the mid-year changes that we're asking you to approve tonight. Our general fund five-year forecast is stable and shows continued economic growth or recovery. Revenues are a bit stronger than we budgeted, and business activity continues to improve, and we're seeing positive changes in tourism. However, there are significant legal liabilities remaining. This demands fiscal restraint. And this is hindering our ability to bring forward programs and services to levels that meet current needs. Additionally, we have mounting infrastructure and deferred maintenance needs, and our reserves must be built up so that we can continue to be resilient in an event of an emergency. Okay, so now I will present the mid-year adjustments. <clears throat> The revenue and expenditure budget adjustments that I'm summarizing for you tonight are all detailed in attachment A of tonight's staff report. We are proposing to increase general fund revenues over the initial targets by 1.2 million and 6.4 million in fiscal year 23-24 and 24-25 respectively. The largest amount, which is 4.2 million in 24-25, is primarily a one-time adjustment in transient occupancy tax, hotel revenue, related to the delayed closure of the Fairmont Merrimar Hotel for renovation. Originally, we budgeted less hotel revenue because we anticipated that the hotel would close earlier than uh, at an earlier date. The increase in sales and use tax is due to corrections to the allocation of countywide use tax pools, consumer shift towards online purchases, and also a shift to cons of consumer spending from tangible goods to services, which are not subject to sales tax. The property tax adjustment primarily reflects a 2% inflation factor applied per Prop 13 this year. Business license tax reflects greater than projected gross receipts reported by businesses this year and focused compliance efforts by the business license unit. The decrease in parking related revenues is due to changing behaviors of parkers from telecommuting and hybrid work schedules, the use of alternative modes of transportation by visitors to Santa Monica, and also the increased use of the free 90-minute parking at the parking structures. Other adjustments include a decrease from a later than projected receipt of the first supplemental payment per development agreement for the Miramar development project due to project delays. Also included are various adjustments to other miscellaneous revenues as detailed in attachment A. It is important to know that while we're increasing revenues in both years, the additional revenue is enabling us to continue to have the balanced budget throughout the forecast. We are doing that by using the essentially the same level of working capital reserves as estimated in March of 2023, um, while still being able to address mid-year expenditure adjustments presented to you tonight. The cost increases included throughout the forecast for pension costs, health care rate increases, significant increases to contributions towards insurance, and ongoing funding from the crime data center and the new permitting system. The fiscal year 23-24 expenditure changes in the general fund operating budget result in a nominal effect, a nominal impact of less than $2,000. The mid-year staffing changes um, also include add deletes, new classifications, and equity adjustments based on position changes, internal alignment with duties performed, salary compression, and salaries of comparable cities. 
In total, we're adding 7.3 permanent positions in the general fund, funded by increased revenues, the reallocation of funding from deletion of temporary FTEs, deletion of a vacant management position in the broadband program, and we're also using funding from the airport fund for one position. The positions that are being added include a, a 2.0 FTEs to increase capacity to perform inspections and reduce permitting processing times, which is also critical to economic recovery and getting projects completed. 3.3 FTEs are being added to activate Miles Playhouse, the Camera Obscura facility, expand arts and culture programming, and it has access to park facilities and community use. One FTE is being added to provide focused IT support for the new permitting and land management system. And also one limited term FTE is being added to address the current backlog of maintenance and construction projects at the airport. We are also adding funding for the right to counsel program and to upgrade the below market software, both the items which are funded by the housing trust fund. And lastly, we're making adjustments to the GS revenue obligations associated with the reduction of the transaction and use tax revenue. In fiscal year 24-25, we're increasing the contributions to the general liability and auto self-insurance funds to ensure the fund is sufficiently funded to cover claims and increase insurance premiums. And we're also adjusting budgeted amounts for pension contributions based on the revised valuation reports provided by CalPERS. In the other funds, we're proposing revenue changes in the airport fund due to lease reductions. We're also reducing, um, we have reductions in the Big Blue Bus Fund due to deferral of anticipated capital revenue from project delays. A reduction in the Housing Authority Fund due to lower housing uh, voucher utilization. Various adjustments related to grants. Increased contributions from all funds to the self-insurance fund uh, to ensure that we're sufficiently funded. Increased contributions to the Vehicle Management Fund for new vehicles for RRR, and these vehicles are critical to the delivery of services that we committed to deliver when we increased our RRR rates. And we're also reducing, um, uh, having uh, revenue re reductions in the water fund from reduced water sales, primarily due to conservation efforts. On the expenditure side, in the Big Blue Bus, um, we are increasing contributions to the self-insurance funds for property and transit liability insurance. The Clean Beaches Fund adjustments reflect updated um, sustainability, sustainable water infrastructure projects, SWIP loan repayment schedules. The housing authority reductions are due to lower uh, voucher utilization. And increases in the RR fund are primarily related to increase, to increase contributions to the self-insurance funds. Adjustments in the wastewater fund reflect updated SWIP repayment schedule and increased contributions to the self-insurance funds. And the remaining changes in the other funds primarily reflect grant adjustments and increases related to insurance contributions. Additionally, we are adding two mechanic positions to the vehicle management fund to improve maiden, uh, preventative maintenance of, vehicle, of vehicles. The positions are being funded by service charges billed by the vehicle management fund to all funds based on service delivery. Expenditure adjustments in the Capital Improvement Program budgeted a total of $8.6 million and $1.2 million in fiscal year 23-24 and 24-25, respectively. In fiscal year 23-24, the adjustments include two intra-fund transactions between RRR and Vehicle Management Fund to record the purchase of six vehicles for RRR. The transaction nets out to a $4 million expense. Also included for fiscal year 23-24, is a transaction of moving funds from the operating budget to the capital budget for the Santa Monica Boulevard Safety Enhancement Study. The project is primarily funded with Caltrans, by a Caltrans grant. The fiscal year 24-25 adjustment is related to contributions to the Vehicle Management Fund for the annual, the annual depreciation of vehicles purchased by RRR. And finally, along with the actions required to approve the mid-year budget adjustments, um, we're seeking approval or authorization to accept two grants. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you for your time, and we're here for questions. Thank you so much. Are, are there questions? On my screens. 
nobody in the queue. Any questions from anyone? I yes. see that. Yes. I have a question. Member Tarosas has a question, and then Council Member Zwick, and then Council Member Delatori. Go ahead, everybody. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Oscar. Thank you so much, um, and congrats on your uh, rest first presentation. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, for the Right to Counsel program, the Fetterman Dunn uh, Consulting Contract, uh, is the money that we're asking for for the contract just to pay consultants, or are we actually going to use any money for provision of legal services to folks? Do you want to have Heather come up? And then. Yeah, and then secondly, there is a request that we have like flexible problem solving dollars to keep people in their units, and if the, and I wanted to know if that is included in the right to council allocation as well. So we'll have our housing and human service director Heather Averick come up and answer your question, council member. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Hi, council member Derosis. Um, so to answer your question in relation to the amount for Fetterman Dunn, that's for the contract itself for them to do the consulting services. And are we planning on making any money available to reflect the like shower subsidies to keep folks housed who need um, just like a quick month's rent and are able to get back on their feet? That was also a request as part of the, the motion around and protections in the to council. Yes, I believe we are, but I would have to go back to staff to confirm that amount. Okay, I just um, ask that we don't forget about that. I think there's a number of items related to housing. Obviously, they have questions about that. I don't want to go over here, but um, we certainly want to see an increase in the pod program. But then, as part of right to council, it was um, a best practice to make um, small amounts of money available to keep people in their homes before the case gets to. Uh, an unlawful detainer, um, which is usually much more expensive at that point. And, and council member, if I may, there was an item uh, earlier in the evening um, affirming our um, ability to submit for the pro housing um, grant designate um, the incentive program after we received our pro housing designation, excuse me. Um, and uh, we are applying for up to a million dollars. And um, within that application, we're asking for that million dollars go to uh, the emergency flexible assistance funding um, because that's a um, program that we had identified our housing elements so that pro the funding um, should we be successful and get the full one million dollars will come from that and the Fetterman Dunn um, results will help us determine sort of you know how to be most effective with that resource but that's where mm -hmm. the currently we're hoping to, to leverage the, um, that program and get the dollars from Okay, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, way to tie it all together. Uh, and then secondly, uh, for the increase of the two FTEs, so this is a separate question not related to this. I thank you so much. Um, for the two FTEs for community development for the building inspectors, are these just inspector? Can you just explain to me a little bit more about what types of inspections these building inspectors are doing? I assume that it's not nothing is related to code enforcement. It's all related to building and safety. Good evening, Council. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, these are separate from code enforcement. These are uh, the folks who go out and do the building inspections. Um, so not related to code enforcement at all. And that would help us on our economic recovery, getting um, things permitted, approved, entitled, uh, and built more quickly, I assume? Absolutely, yeah. The, you know, we have, um, pre-COVID, we had uh, pretty consistent next day inspections. So if you called for an inspection, you got one the next day. At this point, we're about two to three weeks out. So this will really help us get closer to where we were before. And you know I always say this, but as long as we can track um, uh, baseline and then progress in terms of how we're expediting turnaround time, I would love to six months a year from now hear about how those two inspectors helped us facilitate um, and uh, permits and reduce timelines. Yeah, we'd be happy to report on that. Thank you. I just want to also mention that Jim Brewster, our lead inspector, is here tonight. So thanks for coming, Jim, and thank you for all your hard work. Oh, great. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Zwick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oscar, for the report. Um, there's a common theme, obviously, when it comes to some of these high expenditures around insurance claims, premiums, healthcare costs, unfunded pension liabilities that I know are not 
uh, unique to our city, um, nor of course are a lot of the inflationary uh, costs that we're dealing with. I'm just curious, nonetheless, um, while these are reflective of national trends, like what, if anything, are we attempting as a city to try to control some of those costs going forward? So, uh, all this, all right, I think I tried right, I'll talk to you about the insurance. Yeah, so, I mean, as you talked to you earlier in my capacity as an acting HR director, I'm also a service manager, so we see all the insurance, and you saw a big increase in general liability insurance costs, which is really hitting the bottom line. And to answer your question, um, Council Member Zwick, it's really a national phenomenon, especially in municipalities in Southern California, they're dealing with this. But that, as city attorney's office can tell you, the higher litigation costs, uh, jury verdicts, they make it impossible. We, what we've done in the past, we belong to Excel, which is a JPA composed of other 12 cities. So we're actually seeing lesser costs than we've seen otherwise, if we're actually going out in the insurance market. So that's really the big thing that's really, I think, decreasing our cost overall. And also, every time we were doing insurance renewals with our brokers, we asked them for analysis of what they can do to minimize the cost going forward for each of our different insurance lines. Thank you for that. Um, uh, to the to the parking um, fees, uh, that revenues that are anticipated, as well as the deficits projected in the pier and beach funds, my understanding is this is partly to do with the fact that it's difficult for us to raise parking rates within the coastal zone, and that we are in the process of applying to do so. And I'm just curious as to where we're at with that in our efforts and our timeline for potentially being able to get approval for higher rates. Yeah, so one of the requirements is to conduct a parking study, which uh, DOT is conducting now. Um, I'm not sure about, do you know the timeline? So we're completing the study now um, to meet some of the requirements set by uh, the Coastal Commission so that they can then evaluate our application for, for increasing rates. Good evening again, uh, Council. So yeah, uh, Council Member Zwick, just um, specifically um, last fall, we did receive approval from the Coastal Commission what would they call after the fact approval for our 2018 parking uh, rate increases and as part of that approval they issued a set of conditions that we would need to meet in order to uh, come back to them for approval of any future parking rate increases so we what we're doing now is uh, embarking on a parking study uh, part of which will be to as we do with all parking studies assess parking utilization demand how much you know supply we have but also specifically uh, those conditions so we're going to be coming to council uh, next month uh, in March with a uh, recommended uh, contract with a, uh, a vendor um, through a competitive procurement that we did for that parking study. Um, and that would set us up to then, um, you know, uh, do that study, assess those conditions uh, in compliance with the coastal directive, and then return um, at a future time once that study has been done uh, with any potential changes uh, to parking rates, um, you know, uh, in, in the future. Uh, after obviously a, a robust community engagement process as well. If uh, if Coastal just approved, you know, the, the rates from I guess 2018. I mean, are we is this anticipated to be like another like six years before we could actually change our rates, or would we be able to change them and then receive approval retrospectively in some way? Is that what you said? Uh, that's what happened the prior time, but but this would be um, approval. Um, you know, once we fulfill the, the coastal conditions. Uh, of any forward-looking parking rate increases. So um, I don't think at this point we want to pin ourselves down to a specific timetable, but I'd say within the next one to two fiscal years, um, once we've done the study and once we've um, done the community engagement, obviously we would need both council and coastal to approve those rates, um, and then we would be able to put them in place right away. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Council Member Delatory. Yes, uh, thank you, Tokayo, for your uh, great presentation. I just had a couple of question, questions. Uh, um, the, um, the resolution regarding the salary rates and the new classifications, um, we got some emails, you know, residents concerned, you know, that, that, um, that some of these uh, adjustments were, were potentially excessive, and, and I wanted to just clarify that. I mean, is this to keep, you know, our, uh, our organization competitive? It is. It is that um, we did comparisons to other cities, of course, and then you know changing the scope of um, responsibilities as well were factored into that. 
Yeah. I think our HR director will speak a little bit more to yeah. that. And then, and then the other multiple hats. Great. And then the other question: uh, What a, a equity adjustment? What what is what is an equity adjustment? So I'm back, different capacity, HR now. So <laughs> so equity adjustments are actually very common nowadays in the organization. Basically, it's to address. Um, Alignment, internal alignment with duties performed, salary compression, and also retention hiring issues. Those three different components. So depending on which classification we're discussing, these are the issues we're actually trying to address. Sure. Any other questions about this HR. salary, HR related, since I'm up here? I know. What else can I do? Housing? No. Well, Heather is fine. She did a good job. Um, IT? Do you have more questions? Uh, actually, come back up for a minute. But I want you to put on a different hat, okay. just just for the hell of it. Okay, I don't have any left. All right, all right, <laughs> good. Uh, my question is, uh, there was an article in the Santa Monica Mirror which spurred the discussions about the equity increases. Now, I understand at least a portion of that article was not accurate. Um, so what the article seemed to say was that the affected staff members would be receiving um, the amount of their increase that they're getting that they would get this year every year? That's not true, is it? That is not accurate. I think they were mistaken for the call increases, which we typically negotiate with bargaining groups. This is one one-time equity increase. Okay, and then uh, secondly. Um, the uh, they were both uh, several of them were listed at step five, and I understand they would not all be at step five. That was a classification, but they would actually be at a lower classification in some cases. It really depends. Um, typically, in resolution, we list everything at step five. That's why they got the step five from. Okay, so the increases are one time. They are in line with neighboring cities, would you say? Do, have we done any kind? My God, my microphone just sank. Um, is, wow. Um, OK. Um, while we're asking that, have there been comparative studies in other cities of those particular job titles? Those are really related to internal alignment, just because of the compression issues. But we did look at, and I can only point to two cities, which is Beverly Hills and West Hollywood, and they're comparable. Okay. In terms of the increases, the salary being in line. That's that's what I'm asking. So yes. for neighboring West Side cities, and uh, that we would compete against. They're in line. Explain salary compression. Salary compression happens when someone who is subordinate mem um, individual gets a higher the paid increase, whatever the reason, equity adjustment, whatever. And what happens, we'd like to have a differential between the person who is supervisor and the su person being supervised. And basically, we need we need make to that even make that easier to understand for someone watching on TV. Right. Sure. So I um, when let's say, I'm going to use myself as an example as a risk manager. Um, my salary will be so high up to Oscar's salary, well, basically the difference will be really minimal. Let's say like 2%. We strive for something larger. We don't want to pinpoint the number, but typically we strive for something around 10% to be the difference between whoever is you're, super, you're supervising and yourself. So that's the adjustment. Right, depending on the different classification, yes. Okay, and that is comparable. I know I'm repeating myself. That's comparable to other West Side cities that we looked at. Correct. Okay. Thank you so sure. much. I won't call you up again. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. All right. Council Member Dilatori, are you done? You can remove yourself from the queue. Council Member Davis. Well, are we done with questions? Because no, I think we're I think we're good. All right. So um, Oscar has done a great job with us. Great, and thank you, thank you for the great presentation. Yeah. Um, so since it's the hour is late, um, I would like to move the staff recommendation um, to appropriate the fiscal year 23-24 mid-year revenue and expenditure budget adjustments 
and approve the corresponding adjustments to the fiscal year 24-25 budget plan and also adopt all the other recommendations including receiving the update to the forecast, adopt the resolution, establish new classifications, approve a position and classification changes in attachment C, adopt a resolution abolishing unused and obsolete classifications and associated salary rates, authorize the city manager to accept a grant award in the amount of $200,000 from LADAP, authorize the city manager to accept a grant award in the amount of $135,000, and adopt a finding of no possibility of significant effect. I do have one change to the um, recommendation included in the staff report, so I wanted to get that all on the table. Um, and you didn't discuss it, but but one of the recommendations was that you increase the council travel budget by $14,000, which would be $2,000 per council member. Um, and, uh, and we also has, there was also an uh, increase in our discretionary fund. Um, as we heard later this evening, we're going to have the opportunity to support, uh, hopefully, uh, some of our young people who will be going to Europe. Um, but I don't think we need to include increase the travel budget. So I would propose that instead of increasing the travel budget by $14,000, we put that $14,000 back into the council discretionary fund, add $1,000 to it and give $5,000 to each of our business improvement districts, the Pico Improvement District, the Montana Merchants and the Main Street Merchants for them to do community building and promote local business. Second. So if I could just back up for a minute, I think the first motion needs to be taken separately because it needs to be done as the council and the authority, but then the other six recommendations. Oh, okay. And what would my change be in the first one or the second one? The Maybe. second. Okay. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll move the first one then, which is to appropriate the 23-24 mid-year revenue and expenditure budget adjustments. Second. Any discussion on that item? Seeing none, let's do a roll call vote. Council Authority Member De La Torre? No. Council Authority uh, Member De La, I'm sorry. Council Authority Member Tarosis. <clears throat> yeah, yes. Mayor Chair Pro Tem Negrete? No. Council Authority Member Davis? Yes. Council Authority Member Parra? No. Council Authority Members Wick. Yes. Uh, and Mayor Chair Brock. No. I think there was some confusion because I think you, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you were all voting no because of my proposed amendment, which is not in the first part that you all just voted no on. Did you all understand that, or did you all mean to vote no can on the you, budget? Can you read can, so the, can I just number one and keep the no, voting I, I want, open? I just want one second. The, the first item, what, the first item is, what do we, what's the specific thing we're voting on here? It's a call for a motion for the City Council and the Housing Authority to pro appropriate fiscal year 2023-2024 mid-year revenue and expenditure budget adjustments and approve corresponding adjustments to the fiscal year 2024-2025 budget plan. So I, this is important, so I want Oscar, so that first item, though, is appropriating the travel budget change and discretionary changes, correct? Because it it's 2324 money. It is. Okay, oh, so, okay. So okay, because I thought the clerk had said that would be in the sure second we're absolutely motion. absolutely clear on this, because this is... This, it is in there. So okay. this first item addresses the issue of okay. discretionary and travel. So... So Mayor, now let's reset and... Yes, no reset. Council Member De La Torre. Yeah. Well, I think the city attorney had a... I wanted to note this is a it, this is a budget amendment. It requires five votes to pass too. The first item. Okay, I so I think there's a lot of confusion on this item. Listen. So because uh, Council Member Davis had a long item, a short item, I, I thought. Well, I just did the so, whole recommendation. You want, let, let's be really clear. So this, the first item is about amending the 2324 budget. So within the amendment to the 2324 budget is the recommendation to allocate additional money to discretionary funds and additional money to travel. So if 
that's going, if there's a motion on the floor to change that, that's embedded in this first item. I just want to make sure we're all clear. And what, okay, you know, I was not clear. Okay, so, what, so, so the attorney is saying is this item requires five votes. Correct. All right, so so since I still have the floor, so let me, maybe if I just restate the motion and we can re-vote on it, but everyone will be clear, which is I move item one, uh, the staff recommendation for the city council and the housing authority that we appropriate the mid-year revenue and expenditure budget adjustments with the one change of not increasing the council travel budget by $14,000 and instead returning that $14,000 to the discretionary fund, add $1,000 out of the discretionary fund to that and allocate $5,000 to each of the small bids in town, Montana merchants, Pico Improvement Organization, and Main Street merchants for them to do uh, programs and events that will promote local businesses and uh, uh, promote community. Have, I, I have a question. Oh, well, I think there needs to be a second. I don't know if there's a second. And I, I, sec I second that. Okay. So my first question, did the bids uh, put in a request for that, or is that just well, I, I've, re I've received inquiries from some of the bids that they would like more money to do more events, yes. And they didn't have, ask for a specific amount, but they, they would like more money to do more events. And we have three bids in the city. Well, we actually have four if you count downtown Santa Monica, which is actually a P-bad, but they're self-funded, so. Council Member Delatore. I'd like to make a substitute motion that essentially uh, very similar, but we, we're, we're talking about twenty thousand dollars. That was five thousand times four. No, no, it was it was fifteen thousand dollars. It was fourteen taking fourteen thousand from the proposed increase in the travel budget, adding a thousand out of the discretionary fund. So it'd be five thousand dollars each. I'd, I'd like to make a a, a substitute motion that we uh, that we split that between the 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 uh, bids and and the neighborhood groups. The neighborhood associations but not increase the travel budget well and increase the travel budget well now you're wiping out the discretionary fund how much how much are we talking about there, there was 40,000 additional 25,000 to the the discretionary fund 14,000 to the travel fund and that's so it's 50,000 total 50, 50. Right. Oh, so sorry. it's 36, 36 discretionary, right. 14,000. Right. 15,000. But, but I want to, but we haven't yet, for example, received any requests from the high school for graduation support. Um, we heard tonight, for example, that the music group actually would like to have 20,000 instead of 15,000. So if you take the 15,000 and you add on top of that money for the neighborhood groups and you still want to have money left over, I don't, I don't know how much you're proposing for the neighborhood groups, but I think you know, the question is how much would be left over for subsequent allocation then if we did that. I have a question. Without, without your amendment to, you know, divvy up funds to, uh, um, how, how, much, how much again is, is, uh, is, is being allocated to the discretion, to discretionary fund? The current allocation is again? how much? 36,000 to discretionary. And the 14. additional? 36,000 additional to makes the total and the 14,000 to increase Hold the on. travel budget Hold on. Make sure so the, the total, total is 50,000 um, which is broken out 14 to uh, travel and 36 to discretionary and how much will the discretionary fund be after we add the 36,000 that was my question we'll get you that give us one sec I thought it was 68 or something and it resets one is it left over or the annual So if we add the 36,000, you have 86,000 left in discretionary. 80, 80,000 80, left. How much? 80,000 left in discretionary. So we would have 80,000 in the left. discretionary fund. If we add, yes, if we add. Absolutely the, enough to fund huh? Samuel High and other things that we need to do for oh. the year. Okay. Council Member Delatore, are you finished? Can I move on to Council Member Negretti and yes. you can come back? Yeah, go ahead. I just want to confirm. So we have 80,000 between now and July 1st. If we add the 36, yes. Right, so it resets to what in July 1st? Okay, July 1st, it'll reset to about 126, so about 126,000. So for the next four about months, 24, 25, yeah. we have 80,000 
and whatever is left over from the travel fund. And then whatever we don't spend in the travel fund rolls back into there. Then that travel has to be booked by June or whatever, right? For that to come out of. Hey. Booked by June 30th. by June 30th. Right. Okay. That was all. I okay. So you've made a motion that's been seconded. I'd make a substitute motion that the original motion that the finance director and the city manager uh, gave us be adopted. And and discussion on that, we can we can always move uh, money later. Later, exactly. So if if someone wants to put more money into the bids or neighborhood groups or travel, we could do that at a later day. Yeah. And this will help us just move forward and get. Or this if passed. someone doesn't want to use travel money, they don't need to. Then they can donate it uh, back to the discretionary, discretionary fund at their at their leisure. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, call the question. Okay. So this is on the subject, which is the original motion, as. Uh, recommended by staff, motion by uh, Mayor Brock, and seconded by De La Torre. Councilor De La Torre, correct? Yes. Okay. Council Authority Member De La Torre. Yes. Council Authority Member Tarosis. I, I think there are two hands raised with questions on the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I apologize. I didn't look over at you. I'm sorry. I just looked at my blue screen. Uh, I, so let's hold the vote for a minute. Uh, Council Member Zwick. Jesse? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. Um, I think I just have to weigh in on, on this. Um, you know, there's a lot of community concern because obviously this recovery, as we all know, both our city's fiscal situation and the individual um, um, fortunes of a lot of our small businesses and families um, are continuing, many, many people in our city are continuing to struggle as we recover from COVID. And while I'm well aware that 14,000 is a small amount of money, I've, I've also heard a lot of community concern, even about the size of our travel budgets as they exist now. So it feels strange to not at least have a conversation about what it means to increase them um, when, uh, we're in a position in our city where, where, where you know, we're having to borrow from funds to keep the lights on. I just think there's a lot of people in our community that could benefit more from that money than enhancing our own travel budgets. Councilmember Tarosis. Uh, yeah, I just have a question. Are we still splitting up the money to give an, an equal allocation to the big the neighborhood groups in the travel budget? I just I need to no, that's not what clarify. The motion is. That was this is a substitute motion that restores the original intent of the city's finance Got director it. and city manager. Okay. Thanks. Council member Negretti. Oh. I didn't mean to be in there. Okay, Council Member De La Torre. Yeah, I just, uh, I, this is just makes it a lot simpler. I mean, it's late, and we, we can come back to all the funding allocations that everybody's talked about today. I just think that we should move forward. Okay, let's try that vote once again. We're vacating uh, Oscar's vote and starting over. Council Authority Member De La Torre. Yes. Council Authority Member Torosis. No. Mayor Chair Pro Tem Negrete. Yes. Council Authority Member Davis. No. Council Authority Member Para. Yes. Council Authority Members Wick. No. Authority, um, oh, well, that's it, because the other, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Chair Brock. Uh, no. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm now yes on this. I caught myself just in time. Well, it yes. Fails because it's we need five votes and it only got four. That was what the staff recommended. Right. Still a mid-year budget adjustment. Wait, no, we aren't. No, we aren't making a change. We, we are. That was the original motion. No, no, no. We're we're making a um, the the motion was a affirming um, what we brought forward, but we're actually changing the twenty three twenty four budget because. There's new expenditures to it, so that part's changing. Got it. Five votes. That part, so we do need so five votes. So it has votes. to be a supermajority. Right, ac according, yes. I, I move that we uh, take another re-vote and see if we can get the five this time. I'll second. Council 
Council Authority Member De La Torre. Yes. Council Authority Member Tarosis. No. Mayor Chair Pro Tem Negrete. Yes. Council Authority Member Davis. No. Council Authority Member Parr. Yes. Council Authority Members Wick. No. And Mayor Chair Brock. Yes. Still fail. It still fails. It, you need five votes. I'm in the queue. Oh. Council Member Davis. Now the first motion is still on the floor. Right, because that was that, that was what I was going to ask. Is my motion still on the floor, which is to adopt the budget with the one change of returning the fourteen thousand dollars in travel allowances to instead of giving it to council members to travel, um, to return it to the general fund and then reallocate five thousand dollars each to Montana Merchants, Main Street Merchants, and the Pico Improvement Organization to do community building events and promote local businesses. Council member Negretti. Okay, so I think we all, whether you're traveling for housing or traveling for public safety or National League of Cities conferences, um, the idea is that you're going to bring things back to the city. And obviously the discretionary fund is to help the community more directly with various needs, um, whether it be schools or specific events that we're putting on or the neighborhood groups and bids. But ultimately, we have to look at this two ways. So we're either putting it back in and giving it directly to the bids without them asking for it, and they usually come to us and ask for it. I, I don't know where that number is coming from. I'm sure they can use it. Trust me. I, I know everybody will take the money willingly. Um, I know that Montana is probably going to come and ask for something to close down the street. So I don't know if it makes sense to give it up front or not, but I can tell there's a push and pull. I mean, obviously, some people are uncomfortable with putting it in travel, um, and I can understand that. If those council members that want to travel more, the question is, you just come and present it if you have a trip. We've done it before, I guess, to get more funds. Is that's an option, correct, city attorney? I mean, if there's a trip that you want to take and you've run out of funds, obviously, you can either borrow from someone who wants to give up their excessive funds, but what happens in the event that one council member wants to go on a conference trip um, and they've run out of funds and another council member is sitting on their funds but doesn't want to distribute them to the other council members? There are some rule we can put in place where if it's going to expire at the end, that person, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, how we can resolve this issue and come to some happy meeting because Outside of coming to council, you'd have to put a 16 item on if you've ran out of your money to ask for that money to come from what, the discretionary funds? You could appropriate any unappropriated funds or move funds from another fund, but again, that's by votes to do that. Right. Does everybody know what their trips are coming up? I mean, have we sat down and... We all had a... Yeah, I mean, I know what it says so far, but... Because we're talking about between now and July. Yeah, I have mine. We're, we're talking about between now and July. Does somebody have a problem where they know they're going on something? Because maybe we can solve it right now. I mean, I got cancer, so I'm probably not going anywhere this summer. I'm just put that out there. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we vote, uh, we the, there's a staff recommendation on the table, right? And Councilwoman Davis is making a change to give money to the bids. Um, if we can't get the five and we're going to stay here all night, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to just recommend, I'd like to support the recommendation of staff. They, they vetted it. There's all these people here that have put in a bunch of hours to make this recommendation to us. I think it's the responsible thing to do is, is, is to support our staff at this time. And if we want to support the bids, as Councilwoman Negrete said, there, no one came to say, hey, we really need this money. If they did, we probably can support that right now, but they didn't. So it doesn't stop us from uh, putting a 16 item to, 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 to bring that uh, uh, recommendation, that funding allocation back. I just think that, I mean, it's late. I, I would like us to support the uh, staff recommendation so that we can move forward. And then if we meet with the different bids and they Maybe they need more money. Maybe they need less. I don't know. But we, I, I do know that they're getting a sizable amount of money. I think uh, 
uh, I, I've heard of budgets of eighty thousand dollars a year, a hundred and something thousand dollars a year, where the neighborhood groups only get. Can someone tell me how much neighborhood groups are getting right now in the city of Santa Monica? Like what the allocation is? I think it's like five or seven thousand dollars. I don't it's, think it's that much, or maybe even less. I think it's, it's seven about seven thousand dollars per group. Okay, seven thousand dollars per group versus a budget of eighty thousand minimum. A high, that's why I made the recommendation that would, I was hoping it would be acceptable that we can uh, support those neighborhood groups as well. So I would, uh, if, if, if uh, Councilwoman Davis, I mean, if you're okay with splitting it, you know, so that we can uh, fund the, the neighborhood organizations and also the bids. Um, I don't think we're giving any bid eighty thousand um, dollars. I think no bids. Yeah, the, the bids. The bids may have that much money. They may have that much money. They may have that budget, but it's not from the city. No, correct. But it is well. It's from the businesses, right? All the businesses are, are paying into that fund. For some of the bids, yes. For some of them, they do fundraisers. I mean, I don't. Have, I'm next in the queue. I, 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 yeah, I'm. I, I'm not sure. What you're asking? Do you well, want what I'm what I'm asking is: is you have the neighborhood groups that get seven thousand dollars each, and then you have the bids that get like eighty thousand or plus each, right? But, they, but the neighborhood groups get seven thousand from us. The the bids don't get eighty thousand from us. It just feels, I feel like you're trying to draw a false equivalency here. No, I'm looking at equity. I mean, we should be looking at everything with the lens of equity, and and so if if there's if there's groups that that already have more money in the, in, in the community because they they're able to you know uh, get a, a a special tax let's say on these businesses the neighborhood groups don't so their their only way to get in funding is from the city of Santa Monica there's no other source of revenue no they have other for ways for example OPA has membership fees okay so they used to raise money well that's good to know so I mean the question is how do we get the five votes I, I, tonight? I think Noma does too. I can't say about PIO to be honest with you. But I mean, but yeah, I mean not PIO, um, some of the other ones. But I, I think when I was in Noma, yeah, I paid a membership fee, and I'm in OPA, and I pay a membership fee. So they do have alternate ways to raise money. I would like to join you in a, in, a, in an item that we can bring back as a third, as a 16 item to to request that type of allocation. I'd support that with you. I'm just trying to find out how we can get. All the staff are here today. Can we get a vote to move forward and bring that item back at a, at a later date? I, I, I mean, I'd have to get more information about, I think council Chris, members yeah. Wick and Tarosis both have their hands up. But the one thing I just want to say is, I mean, I'll just be honest with you and say some of my hesitancy about this is I don't think we should increase our travel budget. Is that we all knew what our, we, we had a robust discussion about our travel budget before this year's fiscal year. And we all knew what our travel budget was, and we all got staffed. Every time we send a penny out of our travel budget, we know what it was. We all have these sheets that tell us how much money we have left. And, and I agree with Council Members Wick that I just, I don't know why we would increase our travel budgets when we could use the money for other things, whether it's, it may be neighborhood groups, it may be sending more kids on more things. It may be graduation. I'm just, you know, I, I think the last thing we need to do is give our each of ourselves an additional $2,000 to fly around wherever or go to wherever it is we think we want to go. I'll just be honest with you. I don't think that's a good expenditure, but you've got other questions up there, so I'll shut up. Uh, Council Member Zwick. Thank you. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of competing ideas for how this money could be best spent and the, the simplest sort of solution would be to say put it all in the discretionary fund and let people whether it be council members or community groups come to us in the near future with proposals and asks and we can decide as a body whether they are to be awarded yeah we can do that with four votes but it right it take five no matter what Okay. So I would propose that we move to put all 50000 in the discretionary fund and decide where it goes at a later date. Okay. No, it'll take five to do it tonight, but it'll take four votes to spend the discretionary fund. 
Yeah, that's okay. What want, that's what I want to confirm. So if they put it on discretionary and then someone says they put an yeah. item on to use some of the discretionary for travel, is that four or five votes? If that's what you consider within the discretionary fund, however that's defined, then yes. Okay. So so I call the question then. It's been seconded, correct? The motion's been seconded? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Zwick and Davis? Okay, sure. Okay. Call the question. Council Authority Member De La Torre. Yes. Council Authority Member Tarosis. Yeah, just a clarifying question. It's a fifty thousand dollar increase to the discretionary funds period. I didn't hear that number. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay, yes. Mayor Chair Pro Tim Negrete. Yes. Council Authority Member Davis. Yes. Council Authority Member Parr. Yes. Council Authority Members Wick. Yes. And Mayor Chair Brock. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, what's the next part of this motion? So the seven, the rest of the six uh, recommendations cannot be adopted as one. I move, and since I already named them off, I'll move the remainder of the staff recommendations. Do I have to read them again? Thank you. Any comments? Need a second. Questions? Is there a second? I'll second. There is a second by Council Member Parra. And you can call the vote. Council Member Zwick. Yes. Council Member Parra. Yes. Council Member Davis. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete. Yes. Council Member Tarosis. Yes. And Mayor Brock. I'm yes. sorry. I'm sorry. Council Member De La Torre. Yes. And Mayor Brock. Yes. It's after 11 o'clock. Uh, we have one more item left. Is there anyone who wants to stop the meeting now? My God, my my audience is leaving. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. Mayor, Mayor if, if I may, before they all get up, I did just want to take a moment. This was Oscar's first presentation, and so I want to thank him. Thank you, Oscar. And his team, uh, Jennifer Young, our budget manager, is there in the front row. And so just want to thank her very much for her work in stepping up. And Stephanie McNeilis, <clears throat> who is in here, our assistant director. And as they're all leaving, all the wonderful employees who work tirelessly on the budget, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Go plant it. money trees. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So we need um, a motion and a second and a vote. I make a motion to move past 11. I second. Council Members Wick. Can do that on the voice book. No. Oh, that's right. We've got this one. Sorry. Council yes. Councilmember Parr. Yes. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Councilmember Tarosis. Yes. Councilmember De La Torre. Yes. And Mayor Brock. What time is it in Austria right now? It is 8:22 a.m. We started this at 2:30 a.m. Ah, you lost that night. Uh, yes. Okay, well, we'll do the last item and get you to... Actually, you won't want sleep. Now you get breakfast. Item 16A, request of Vice Mayor Negrete and Mayor Brock that the City Council allocate $15,000 in, in Council discretionary funds to support the Santa Monica High School Choir Program. The funds will aid students in participating in a unique opportunity to perform in cathedrals across Spain, including Barcelona, Burgos, and Madrid. These seniors who experienced disruptions due to the pandemic do during their freshman year in 2020 are fundraising for the trip and this allocation would help match some of their raised funds. Um, I think we heard tonight um, the need, which is, is, is beyond what we are giving, but we're being cognizant that we have, um, you know, grad night and other things coming up in the community, but this will help them greatly. It helps um, so many of the students. Um, this is an expensive trip, but what an amazing opportunity to travel to um, another part of the world um, and we are so fortunate that we have such a great music program that the kids are even given this opportunity so for many of these kids it's maybe the first trip on an airplane first trip out of the country many kids are getting their passports for the very first time um, so there's a lot of costs incurred and they've been working diligently and really hard to raise funds and this is just a drop in the bucket to help make sure that every kid gets to get on um, that plane and go on this trip and not have the burden of um, the financial stress to those families. So I hope everyone will support it. Anything? Uh, yes, everything that Vice Mayor Negretti said. <laughs> and uh, I will add, I absolutely agree. This is a trip uh, that these teenagers will remember the rest of their life. 
Um, I happened to run in to not the time that Notre Dame got torched. It was not by our choir. But I happened to be there, I think, the previous year in London at the same time uh, they were going to play in Winchester Cathedral, I believe. And the experience for those youngsters was amazing. Any comments, questions? Delatory, you have a? Oh, no, no. That's OK. So let's take a vote. Need a motion and a second. Oh, motion. So moved. Second. Am I, I'm raising my hand. I don't know. Oh, Someone. sorry. Oh, you have a, yes. Councilmember um, Zwick. Uh, I would just say this sounds great, and if the need is 20, we just found some more money in our discretionary fund, so I don't see why um, I would make a, a motion, or I would like to make a motion to move the item uh, and increase it by $5,000. An amendment? <laughs> Substitute motion. Well, yeah. I'm our, just a friendly can we, amendment. Can we amend the item or no? Because it's, or a friendly uh, amendment. Yeah, um, I, I didn't know it got formally made, sorry. I accept that I didn't want to be greedy and take from the discretionary funds with everybody's needs, and, and so I really appreciate that. We were trying to be cognizant that other people are bringing things forward, but um, that amount would really help um, a couple other families. So, yes, 20000 if we can change it. Okay. okay. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Councilmember Parr? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. And with that, I hope I'll see all of you, and David White will see all of you Thursday, 5 o'clock, at John Adams Middle School Auditorium for the State of the City speech. If you're not tired of us yet, then please join us Thursday evening, 5 o'clock, John Adams, uh, free admission, and there will be refreshments there, and we look forward to talking to you about the State of Santa Monica in more depth. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for making this happen.